This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. All right, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of May 19th. Uh, 2021, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the opening meeting law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12, 2020. This planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Jack Jumsek, and as a chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I'm calling this meeting to order at 7.35, uh, say. Uh, this meeting is being Jack, recorded and is available via... Well, Sorry. actually, I, that's what I have on my computer. It's 7... 30, or, or excuse me, 636, sorry. Okay. Did I say seven? You did, and so- Oh, I okay, yeah, so 630, <laughs> oops. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and is available via Amherst Media live stream. Minutes are being taken. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, uh, answer affirmatively, and then uh, place yourselves back on mute. Um, Maria Chow? Here. Tom Long? Here. Andrew McDougall? Present. Doug Marshall. Present. Janet McGowan. Here. And Johanna Newman. Not on yet. Okay, and myself. Okay, I suspect that Johanna will be on shortly. Board members, if technical issues arise, please let Pam know. If technical difficulties occur, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed and the minutes will note if this happened. Please use a raise hand function to ask a question or make a, a comment. I will see your raised hand and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and reserved for comments regarding items that are not on tonight's agenda. Public comment may also be heard at other appropriate times during the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment, join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link, which is shown. Um, and it's also available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website via the calendar listing for the meeting. You can also go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent uh, agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raised hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. When called on, please identify yourself by making, uh, by stating your uh, full name and address and put yourself back in your mute when finished speaking. So uh, residents can express their views up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair, if a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation uh, will be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, with that said, we can go to item one, which is the minutes. And we have minutes of April 21st. Correct, okay. Um, and I am looking from other board members with regard to any comment or motions on, on these minutes. So moved. Okay, so... Uh, Andrew? Second. All right. And any discussion on the minutes? I see no hands raised, so I'll do a roll call. Uh, Maria? Approved. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Janet? Approved. Johanna, is she here yet? No, okay, and myself, so that's a six zero. All right, so um, 
And we have a public comment period. And I'm looking uh, at our attendees, see if any hands are raised. I see John, uh, Brendan Bailey, mm -hmm. Nino, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name, but um, so we have three hands raised and we can start with John. Um, Jack, may I just say, um, were you planning to um, address public comments um, for the inclusionary zoning and the moratorium at the time that the board is talking about those things? In other words, oh, are, are you looking for public comments that are not about things on the agenda right now? Yeah, they should know that. So, you know, um, we will not accept comments on the, on the topics that we will be discussing tonight, which are really focused on the inclusionary zoning bylaw, Article 15, and the temporary moratorium, uh, building moratorium, uh, Article 16. So those two things are on our agenda. So folks that are, uh, you know, want to, you know, present public comments should know that they don't want to pre present comment yet on that because they they will have their opportunity later. And those hands have gone down. Okay. <laughs> so, John, um, thank John you. John Hornick, I have enabled you to speak. Did you have a comment that you wanted to make now or are you going to wait? No, I'm going to wait. Okay. I lowered my hand. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, okay. So, we have, uh, we're meeting, we're going to start the, Inclusionary, inclusionary zoning uh, meeting at seven with, you know, jointly with the CRC. So we have, we have about, you know, 15 minutes or so to go over the uh, other items that are on our agenda. And do you, um, Chris, do you think we should just go to old business? Sure. Okay. Old business, we can talk about 462 Main Street. You mentioned that before the meeting began. And Correct. Word, um, back, uh, I think it was last year in 2020, early 2020, um, reviewed um, a proposal for 462 Main Street, which is John Robleski's property along the railroad tracks along Main Street. And at that time, um, you were reviewing an amended site plan review application for um, 20, 24 apartment units and um, you approved it. That was amended from a previous application that was for 16 apartment units. Um, but, uh, and Mr. Robleski at that time was going to continue to use the house that's on that property. It's a white house with red shutters. He was gonna continue to use that for, um, for office use as he'd been doing since he bought the property and the previous owner had also used that for office use. Um, in any event, uh, he is finding that um, he feels that it's gonna be harder to fill that building for office use. The building has a number of, um, what should I say? It has a number of quirks being an old building. Um, it's not handicapped accessible. It's a little bit, um, it's got some, issues related to moisture and other things. So anyway, he is coming to the um, historical commission and asking for um, permission to demolish that building, that white building with the red shutters. Um, so I don't know when that hearing is. I think it might be tonight, actually. Um, Mr. Morris nodding his head. So that the historical commission is meeting tonight and, um, and that is being considered. Um, what he wants to do is use that space that um, would be there after the building comes down to uh, have some additional parking. And I think he also wants to have a little utility building there of some sort. Um, you know, and I, I think it's, you know, bicycles, equipment, and different things like that. So anyway, he's proposing that to the Historical Commission tonight, and we'll see what they say about that. And then... Um, if, if it transpires that he does take the building down and he wants to use that property for something else, he would have to come back to the planning board and uh, file an application for um, an amended site plan review. So, so um, 
you know, we approved a plan that that had that that built that building was involved within the plan that we approved. Um, I think that the 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 trash, you know, or, or you know, I think a bicycle shed or trash receptacle or something, several things. Or, um, I mean, at what point will we see that, if at all, Chris? Um. Perhaps you would like to consult Mr. Mora, who's here. He knows a little more about it than I do. I'm not as much up to speed as he is. Yes, please, Rob. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, so you're right. He, he originally had in his proposal to alter, you know, create, do an alteration to the, um, I think it was the north end of that building to create the uh, trash and recycling storage and, and improve that area a little bit of the, the building. So if he, um, you know, receives a approval from the commission to demolish tonight and decides to move ahead with um, altering the site plan uh, with a new building or altering the parking spaces and removing that building, then that would be submitted to the planning board. Uh, I would expect soon uh, because I, I know just from talking with the uh, applicant that, you know, I think they found that moving forward on renovating the building wasn't the best option for him at the moment. And he would like to switch gears and, and go this other route. So I think if there wasn't a delay put on the project, then uh, we would pretty quickly see plans developed and submitted for uh, the planning board's review. All right. Thank you, Rob. Um, Pam, I think we know that, that Johanna is with us. 645 ish. Yeah. I put 644. Oh, okay. Good, good. Okay. Hi, Johanna. Thank you. Hi, Johanna. Um, other old business, Chris? I can't think of anything. Okay. And any new business items we want to talk about? Now we got like... Jack, little... Ms. McGowan raised her hand. Oh, sorry. During that yeah. conversation. So I just have a question about the Victorian house because that was the primary use of the lot. And I think that, so how many offices were in there? Because I remember that he said he didn't have problems renting the offices and he had had a good clientele. And there's also parking spaces allocated to that use, but do you, does anyone know how many offices are there? Um, or I could, I guess you could look that up if you don't know. Do you want me to answer that? Sure. Thank you, Chris. So Tom Crossman, who is a property manager, um, had his office there, and I think he still does. But he's planning to move into the new building. That space that's being created as part of the mixed-use building is where he's going to be uh, operating. And I think that the other, um, I don't know about the other tenants of the White House, but um, there were probably three or four tenants of the White House, but I don't know if they're still in business. I think what Mr. Robleski said to us was that um, as a result of um, COVID, the COVID situation, and then also as a result of uh, the building being in poor condition and also um, people just not looking for office space, um, that he was envisioning finding it hard to find tenants and that's why he wasn't interested in uh, investing a lot to fix up the building. That's my recollection of what he said. Thank you. And I'm just looking for other hands up. I don't see any. So um, move on to the next item, new business. Chris? New business. I, I can't think of any, I'm trying to think. Um, New business, uh, nope, can't think of anything. Nope. Okay, uh, form A in our subdivision applications. You will be receiving a form A next time um, at your June 2nd meeting. It's going to be um, property up along, let's see, I don't even know the name of the street, but it's- 70 in, Blossom Lane. Thanks, Pam. It was- You're it's welcome. In, uh, it's in a, it's west of, Southeast Street and um, at the very end of Blossom Lane and it's a rather large property and it has a fence that is actually located on its neighbor's property. So um, in order to correct that problem, the neighbor is selling a little strip of land to um, this property 70 Blossom Lane. So you're gonna see that it's a very minor um, 
change for 70 Blossom Lane, it may actually affect the other property adjacent to it more since that property is a flag lot. That property is coming to the Zoning Board of Appeals for a renewal of its flag lot special permit uh, sometime in the next few weeks. So that will be one of the things that Pam would report on under ZBA applications. So, so you'll be seeing that, um, but you won't see it until June 2nd because we haven't heard back from the town engineer. Thank you. Uh, upcoming ZBA applications? There are some. And I made a little slide. So let me just share that screen with you. Can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So the CBA is going to review three new applications at their May 27th meeting. Um, the first one is the one Chris was just talking to, which is the renewal for a special permit for a flag lot. And that is property that's located off of Southeast Street. Uh, another application is for property at 279 Amity Street. Um, and that's a request for a special permit. They, um, they actually are proposing to put an addition onto the house. It's a pre-existing non-conforming one family detached dwelling um, that they're gonna add an addition to. And then at 187 College Street, um, a request has been made for a special permit for a change of use. So the property there is currently um, a one family detached dwelling and they are going to, they're, they're proposing to change it to a non-owner occupied duplex dwelling. Um, and they're proposing to add an addition onto it, um, so to make the property a duplex, there would actually be two. So existing, there is a building that has four bedrooms in it, and they are proposing to add on to that another, um, I guess you would call it a building that would also have four bedrooms in it. Um, and Rob, I don't know if you have more to share about any of those or not, but that's what I know. Thank you. So question we usually ask the planning board is, are you interested in reviewing any of these? Um, they seem to be smaller projects. Would that be your opinion, Chris? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Doug? I think I would want to see the one on College Street since we're talking about multifamily conversions a fair amount. May I ask about the scheduling? Um, Pam, when are these scheduled to go before the ZBA? They're going in front of the ZBA on May 27th. So that would be next Thursday. So unfortunately, there wouldn't be time to have um, a presentation to the planning board. But what we could do is tell the applicant that we want to have a presentation to the planning board and then tell the ZBA that. And then the ZBA could continue the public hearing on May 27th until it had heard back from the planning board. Is that what you would like me to do? Doug, does that sound good to you? Yeah, I hate to be the only one that causes a delay about all this. So it'd be helpful to know whether I'm a lone voice or whether anybody else on the planning board thinks that would be worthwhile. Yeah, I see a bunch of hands. Andrew, Tom, Janet, uh, Andrew. I'm, I'm on board. Let's do it. Yeah, Tom. Same. And Janet. Um, I agree because I I'm just interested in if it's going to be um, student housing and just thinking about Strong Street Street and things like that. I think it'd be good to go through that. Yeah, and I, I agree as well. Um, so, 
Chris, you know, loop them in to us when convenient. Mm -hmm. Okay. That might Thank not you. Be June 16th, because the June 2nd meeting is going to be all about um, Archipelago. So it would have to be June 16th. Okay. That's what I'll do then. Thank you. Great. All right. So um, and th is that it, Pam? Yes. It okay, is. so upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications? Other than Archipelago and Emily Dickinson, um, we don't, as far as I know, have anything definitive at this time. Okay. Going on to the Planning Board Committee and liaison reports, um, I, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, we have a, a meeting, I believe, you know, uh, is it this week or next week? But um, no, you know, uh, no big news. Uh, gonna say oh, same over there, but uh, the CPA, Andrew. Nothing to report. Okay. And the Ag Commission. Uh, yeah, two quick things. We tried to have another meeting last night and uh, again, failed to have a quorum. Um, it's a it's a commission of seven members, and right now there are only four active members, and we got three out of four, but not enough for the for the four person quorum. Um, and then I and then I just noticed on the uh, agenda for this evening, it says that I was nominated, but have not, but I'm still awaiting appointment, and that's no longer the case as of I think it was January. Thank you. So sorry. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Sorry about that. Design Review Board, Tom. Uh, we have not had a meeting since our last meeting. So we had a meeting last Monday, but then we had a, a subsequent meeting where I think I updated you guys uh, that I think we heard from Archipelago again, um, or for the first time as, as DRB. Um, and, and if we have time another time, we can go through the comments. There's there's quite a few, and I think they've been written up. And I can make sure you guys have access to those. Yeah, it, it, sound, it looks like you know we're we're approaching the seven minute or excuse me seven o'clock uh, hearing yeah. time. So yeah, so if you can, you know, yeah. just update yeah. us I'll, next I'll time. I'll forward them on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and zoning subcommittee, we're kind of like, well, we're going to have a joint hearing tonight. So, but Chris, do you have anything else to add? It should really say uh, Community Resources Committee rather than Zoning Subcommittee. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, that's yeah, our I misread fault. that. Yeah, it's my fault. Um, so we had a meeting of the CRC on May 11th. And we tried to talk about a bunch of different things, but I actually, my mind is blanking right now on what we talked about. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and Joe is here if you wanted to hear from her. Yeah, we well, okay. Yeah, but I'm, it's all fine. We, we have a lot on our plate tonight. Um, and so at this point, we can invite the CRC to commence their their part of the the meeting. I'd be happy to, but I don't think there's a quorum yet. Okay. I keep checking attendees to see if they signed in as attendees. Um, All right, we'll just just uh, keep us posted. Um, at, I, I will take the opportunity to update you on May 11th discussion. We were hoping to discuss demo delay bylaw at the May 11th um, CRC meeting, but we did not have time for that. Um, what we discussed in terms of zoning is the apartment definition proposal which I think is coming to you guys. I'm not sure when, Chris would know. <laughs> There's so much in my head right now. I can't grab hold of that date, so sorry. <laughs> Gotta have it written down. Good, good. Um, uh, we're getting a report of the chair. I don't really have that. and report of staff and then and then we actually we can just report of staff would be that we're way too busy <laughs> <laughs> keep it all in our heads yep 
Great. So the rest of the meeting, we'll, we'll, we're going to have these two hearings. Mm -hmm. And uh, once Mandy has the CRC quorum, uh, she is going to chair that. And we'll conclude both hearings. We were thinking about a little bit different process for the planning board. Usually we will, um, you know, hear, hear the, uh, you know, project proposal um, and then get public comment and, and then we'll vote on it, but we're not going to vote on it until CRC, uh, uh, we're, we're going to close the hearing and then deliberate after both hearings have, have concluded. So um, just so the planning board members know that, assuming it's, it's not too late. I see Dorothy Pam and the attendees. Could um, I'm Pam, just, could you pull her in? I can. And Thank I you. was wondering, Mandy Jo, if I should be making you a co-host as well. Uh, if you want to, you may. Okay. Um, I know Nate's going to help me manage stuff. So <laughs> I appreciate that, Nate. Um, and I'm going to focus on writing. So let's see. Mandy okay. Jo. So once Dorothy, Dorothy is in now? She should be, or at least coming on over. There, she is there. So um, seeing a quorum of the Community Resources Committee present, I am going to call the special meeting of the Community Resources Committee to order um, at 7.02 PM. Um, as has already been announced through the planning board, this is virtual by order of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. Um, so I'm gonna just check to make sure everyone can be heard and can hear um, for those on my committee. Shalini. I'm here. Um, Dorothy. Here. Uh, Steve. I'm here. And Evan. Here. Excellent, and Mandy is here. So we have all five members here. Um, as Jack already announced, um, I will be chairing the public hearing um, and opening it and everything. So um, I think we are ready to start, right, Jack? Correct. So at 7.03 p.m., in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 40A, the Amherst Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council holds this joint public hearing on Wednesday, May 19th to consider the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw. Please note in accordance with Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, this meeting will be conducted virtually and will accommodate public comment to the extent practical. This hearing is on zoning bylaw article 15 inclusionary zoning to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw by amending article 15 inclusionary zoning to expand the applicability of inclusionary zoning, including amending the language referring to local preference, expanding the categories of residential uses to which inclusionary, to which in to which the inclusionary zoning requirement applies, requiring a tiered level of affordability for projects, requiring six or more affordable units, adopting a definition for residential development, and increasing the number of affordable units required to qualify for a special permit to allow offsite provision of affordable units or to allow a payment in lieu of provision for affordable units. Uh, so the hearing is open. Here is the plan on how the hearing will go forward. We will start with, I'm, I'm gonna run through the process and then, and then we'll actually do it. Um, we will start with board and committee member disclosures and then we will have a presentation from the planning staff who is the sponsor. I do not believe there was any site visit because this is not um, a site plan review or special permit hearing. So it's on the list, but I don't think that happened um, and normally doesn't. And then it's gonna be questions from the boards and committees from the members here, then questions from the public, then public speaking in favor of revision, public speaking in opposition of revision, the applicant's response or the sponsor's response, if any, and then continuing questions from the board or committee. Once those questions are done at the end of that, um, we will vote to close, we will take a motion and vote to close the hearing. Um, 
comment on the hearing other than the sponsor presentation will be limited to three minutes at a time. Um, and I will be trying to time that accurately, um, but that is how we will do it. And so at that this point, we will start with, are there any questions from the planning board or the CRC members, first of all? Seeing none, we will start with any board and committee member disclosures. Are there any? Seeing none, um, we will move on to the planning staff presentation. I believe it's going to be Chris and Nate. Is that right? Nate will present the, um, the uh, item. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Nate, you're on. It looks like there's a, a member in the, um, <clears throat> in the audience who raised the hand. I don't know if we would want to, there's a question about the process or we wait. Um, so the member of the audience is Andrew Bullock. Please lower your hand if it is unrelated to a question about the process. Keep, please keep it raised if it is a question about the process that we will be going through tonight. Okay, um, I will, since it is still raised, I will, uh, you are using an older version of Zoom, Andrew. Um, so let me see if I can bring you in to ask a question about the process. Um, you should be able to unmute yourself now, Andrew. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Thanks. So I, I guess I have a question about process, but also content. Uh, it was my understanding that perhaps this meeting would address a proposal for a six month postponement of any building. Is this the correct meeting? So that hearing is scheduled to start at 8 p.m. tonight. So there are two public hearings on the schedule, a seven o'clock one on amendments to inclusionary zoning and an 8 p.m. hearing on a proposed moratorium. So we will okay. address that one starting at eight o'clock tonight. All right, well, I'll come back for that then. Thank you. Thank you, you're welcome. Sure, thanks. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'm gonna give a brief presentation and then also <clears throat> then share the bylaw, you know, showing the language as proposed. Is that visible to everyone? Yes. Yes. Sure, great. And uh, so my name is Nate Malloy. I'm a planner with the town. And uh, this is, uh, you know, a few slides about um, the update to the inclusionary zoning bylaw. And the, um, the purpose of the inclusionary zoning bylaw is to maintain and increase the supply of affordable and accessible housing in the town of Amherst. Uh, you know, I think accessible um, is it doesn't necessarily mean ADA accessible, but accessible as in uh, there are lower barriers to access to housing. Uh, the current issue being addressed by the proposed changes. Uh, right now, the inclusionary zoning applies to um, projects that produce 10 or more new dwelling units that require a special permit for the use or a special permit to modify certain dimensional standards, you know, building coverage, lot coverage, additional floors, or uh, increase in height greater than two feet. So, you know, projects that are by site plan or view or by right, uh, they don't, you know, um, they don't trigger inclusionary zoning. Um, <clears throat> and so, as you know, the statement says, a mixed use building in the downtown or in certain zoning districts by site plan or view doesn't uh, provide any affordable units. There are a number of strategies that were used to update the inclusionary zoning bylaw, and we'll see those in the text, but you know, one is uh, elimination of the current threshold for a special permit for use or modifying the dimensional modification. So that threshold is, is changed. Uh, clearly state the bylaw applies to most residential projects. So it you know, clearly states now that it applies to townhouses, apartments, mixed use buildings that result in 10 um, new dwelling units. There are exceptions. Uh, you know, a comprehensive permit project, a 40B project is exempt conventional and cluster subdivision is exempt. Uh, a subdivision is typically about the creation of a roadway and lots and not necessarily about the development of units, ironically, um, you know, because someone can propose a subdivision, but they may not be the developer of the units. Uh, projects in the fraternity zoning district, and there's very limited uh, land, but, and what's allowed in the fraternity zoning district. Uh, inst institutional uses that contain residential units. So, um, you know, if Amherst College, uh, produces, you know, a, a residence hall that isn't subject to this, and then public housing. Um, we're expanding the definition of local preference. <clears throat> uh, we're, as, as Mandy read in the public notice, we're defining 
what it means for new dwelling units and a new definition for residential development. Uh, that term residential development has been in the bylaw, but it was never defined. Uh, require that larger rental projects provide tiered affordability. So two income levels, and then increase the payment in lieu of. Um, there are, there's many elements that are retained from the current bylaw. So the idea that 10 or more units is the, uh, the threshold in terms of project size, that remains the same. The percentage requirements for providing affordable units remains the same. So uh, if, if you produce you know, nine units or less, uh, you know, this, uh, you, that project doesn't need to um, provide affordable units through inclusionary zoning. A developer can always voluntarily though <laughs> provide affordable units. So 10 to 14 new units, it's one affordable dwelling. 15 to 20 new units, it's two affordable dwelling units. And then if it's 21 or over uh, in terms of new units, it's 12% of the total unit count. Uh, and then, you know, it's rounded up uh, if it's in between. Um, and then there is this provision in the bylaw that was adopted uh, more recently, but um, it's a special permit uh, can be issued to modify the percentage of um, um, offsite units. And originally right now in the bylaw, it's four or more affordable units. We're changing that to six, but the bylaw does allow for a provision of offsite units um, or a payment in lieu of. And so there's minor changes to these provisions, but those um, are you know, currently in the bylaw and we're proposing to uh, you know, change those a bit to make it a little bit more challenging in terms of project size or payment in lieu of. In terms of the actual language, uh, is, is this uh, visible for members, the bylaw yep. So in the intent and purpose in 15.03, uh, uh, what's shown in bold italics is, is new language and what's in um, red and strike through is being removed. And so, you know, we're saying to the extent allowed by law, ensuring that the permit granting authority or the special permit granting authority consider offering local preference for new affordable housing as a condition of the permit or special permit. And so there's a number of categories for local preference. And as you can see in red, originally it was, uh, it said to persons who live or work in Amherst, but there are more categories than that for local preference. So the thought is that this new language allows the permit granting authority to expand who, you know, who can, uh, who can, who can be part of local preference. So it's not just live or work in Amherst, it's also if you have school aged children in Amherst. Um, so there's other, you know, and it's also regulated by the state so we can, request it as a permit, we can't require it. We have the town that has to request it through the state. Um, on, in 15.10, again, um, we're including this new language shall apply to residential development, including but not limited to townhouses, apartments, mixed use building, planned unit residential developments or PERDs or open space conservation developments, OSCDs that provide new dwelling units. And then new dwelling units is a, is a new, um, it had been in the bylaw, we're redefining it, uh, meaning uh, a combination of units that have received or will receive a certificate of occupancy in any five year period and are located in new buildings or additions to existing buildings and any net increase in units resulting from reconstruction of existing buildings, except for units resulting from, and then there's a list of clear exceptions. And so, you know, um, you know staff feels that this definition um, given the five-year period and the certificate of occupancy helps um, capture projects that may be phased. So, you know, sometimes developers may phase a project to avoid inclusionary zoning. And so, you know, with this new definition, uh, the idea is that it's, it uh, would capture it. The exceptions are what we've, I've listed um, previously, um, you know, comprehensive permit, a 40B project, a conventional subdivision or cluster development, uh, uses in the fraternity residence, the RF district, uh, institutional uses, um, housing constructed by a public agency, um, and then replacement of units that, um, uh, after damage by fire, water, or natural disaster. And in 15.11, the changes here is um, what's taken out in red is the uh, threshold for the special permit. So now it's reading that any uh, all residential development resulting in new units above the number already existing in the development shall provide affordable units at the following rates. And so, um, you know, instead of requiring a special permit now, it's just they have to, you know, new de any development that has new units. Um, and 
the bylaw already said um, in, um, in the asterisk C sections 4.33 and 4.55, and those are cluster development and open space community development. And so we just included language as a more direct reference. So in those sections, there can be affordable units uh, provided, um, not through inclusionary zoning. We've eliminated the special permit modifications for um, the building coverage, lot coverage, and height. And then with the double asterisk, this is the uh, tiered affordability. When six or more affordable rental units are required, 20% of the affordable units shall be affordable to households earning 60% of the area median income or less as calculated by the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. And so six or, four, six or more rental uh, units, that is a project of 46 or more units. So it's a pretty sizable project that would then have to provide this tiered affordability. 15.12 is a new definition for residential development. It means new dwelling units on one or more uh, adjacent properties developed at the same time or in phases, uh, you know, within the, you know, uh, the five years and that share aspects of the property such as, but not limited to shared utilities, a common driveway, shared parking, or the use of the combined properties for lot or building coverage calculations. And staff included this because oftentimes there are um, adjacent properties where someone will have maybe um, a common driveway and develop it at the same time. And, and really uh, for the context of this bylaw, this is you know, one residential development. Um, and so you know, we're defining it as that. And then the, the, the enumeration for the rest of you know, the subsequent sections is, is different. Uh, that's not shown in bold, but you know, with the new sections, the numbers change. And then in 15.17, this is the provision allowing the permit granting board or special permit granting authority to grant a special permit for modifications. And we're increasing it, except that when it's now six affordable units are required rather than four, it says a minimum of 50% of the units must be provided on site. However, um, there is a provision for offsite affordable units, which isn't changing. And that's only in the BG, BBC. So uh, general business, uh, uh, village center business or neighborhood business uh, and the BL districts abutting BG. So in those zoning districts, um, half the units could be provided offsite through a special permit or within 500 feet. And there's also a payment in lieu of, and- um, Nate, uh, yes. I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Strange, because I could. Is anyone else having the problem, Chris is? Actually, I no, I, can, I couldn't hear anybody. I'm sorry, me, it's me. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so then we have the offsite affordable units and then the payment in lieu, um, again, that's currently in the bylaw and the recommendation is to increase the payment from three times the median income to four times the median income. And the median income is about 75,000. So four times that is um, what we see as um, a relevant amount to, to offset the cost of not providing a unit. So that amount of funding going to the housing trust could uh, help actually build a unit. So, um, so the recommendation is to increase, increase it to four times. And, and those are the changes to the bylaw. Thank you, Nate. Chris, would you like to add anything? Yes, I wanted Nate to explain why we're asking to have 20% of the units be, 20% of the affordable units be reserved for those making 60% or less of area median income. It has to do with the way um, affordable units are um, subsidized. Um, it has to do with Section 8 vouchers, then he can explain that. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I guess I should say that, you know, in our bylaw, we define affordability as 80% of the area median income, and we're in the Springfield Metropolitan Statistical Area, so the MSA, Springfield MSA. So 80% um, of the area median income is a standard definition used by the state and the town. However, um, because Amherst has such a high um, demand for housing and the, the rental amounts are high, at 80% AMI, a voucher holder, and actually a, you know, um, a number of other um, lower moderate income tenants can't afford to live in Amherst. So 80% is actually above the uh, uh, rental amounts that a voucher program even allows someone to live in the unit. So they're not even eligible to apply to those units if it's at 80% AMI. Um, it's closer to 70%. 60% uh, was used also, it's the, um, the area median income amount often used by the low income housing tax credit and other subsidy programs. So it's a, it's a standard amount that's calculated. It's something that Amherst as a town won't be calculating 
on our own. It's already calculated by, by HUD or other agencies. So we're not trying to figure out what is 60%. It's calculated on an annual basis for us and we can use that. Thank you. Um, I think that concludes the sponsor presentation. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. There, as far as I know, there was no site visit, so we don't have to report on that. Um, that means we're on to questions from the planning board and the community resources committee. If, if people who have questions could raise their hands, I will try to recognize them in the order that they are raised. Um, Dorothy. Um, I'm gonna do something I rarely do. Um, I think you've done a fabulous job of putting all these details. I've been to so many meetings where these items were discussed and you've really arranged them in a way that's comprehensible and um, clear. So I just wanna say thank you very much for all your great work. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, any other questions from the boards or committees? Um, and, oh, Jack. I can't raise my hand. Because oh I'm yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you I'll for let, that I'll reminder, Jack and then Andrew. <laughs> I was just wondering about the, the, the magic number of 10 and, and, you know, where's the backup and history for, you know, other towns in the Commonwealth or, or elsewhere where 10 is the number. Um, I don't know if, you know, Nate, you can speak to that or, or Chris. Yeah, I think but, the, um, you know, <clears throat> there's a balancing act with inclusionary zoning. You know, you need a strong enough housing market so that, you know, your requirement for affordable housing doesn't deter development or, you know, have the price passed on uh, to market rate units. And so, for instance, in uh, communities closer to Boston, they start at six units um, and, they have, and they even have a higher percentage, you know, say 15% of the units instead of a graduated, you know, up to 12%. So, you know, when we had our comprehensive housing market study, the consultants thought 10 uh, in 2013 and 15 thought, 10 was the right number, but they actually recommended a 15% um, affordability calculation. And we haven't increased that. So, you know, they thought 10 was appropriate for, you know, the types of development, the size in Amherst and the demand for housing. So, it, it, you know, there's a number of factors that would, you know, weigh on that, on that number. You know, there's a, an economies of scale too. So usually they say under a certain number, it's just not economical to require affordable units. Um, so, you know, we're saying 10 is the right number. But um, in, in actuality, we probably haven't seen that many proposals that are 10. Most of the proposals that we've seen for, for the development are, are greater than 20 uh, in the last few years anyway. I think that, you know, in the last, uh, you know, say 10 years, there's probably been, I, I, have a, I have a number, I have a chart, but there's probably been about 15 developments that, you know, have 10 or more units. Um, you know, it really depends on, um, you know, we also permit a lot of single family homes, you know, so there's other, in, you know, duplexes. So there is a range of, you know, number of units permitted. Okay. I'm, I'm just, I'm just thinking of, of the projects we've seen in the last five years in the, from the planning board. I think all of them have been greater than say 20 sure, sure. units uh, versus the 10, but just, just wanted to get your input on that. Thank you very much, Nate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Andrew. Thank you, um, Nate, great presentation. Um, I, uh, Andrew, we can't hear you. I yeah, can't. we just lost you. Oh, um, can anybody hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, I will try and if not, I'll come back later. Um, so you've identified some loopholes like phase developments, which is great. Are there any other areas that you have concerns that might present potential loopholes down the road? And, and one that popped in my mind was just the, the offsite units. Like one of the nice things about this, this proposal is that you've got sort of the income levels living together. And, you know, is it possible that that, that offsite units could be used to essentially like, I don't dump some some of these units in a different part of BG, BVC, you know, some of those planning districts where we may be missing some of that spirit of, of the, uh, the principle. Yeah, that's a good question. The Housing Trust really discussed this and, you know, they felt that because you already have to provide half the units on site, that providing half offsite and with a geographic proximity, so within 500 feet or the same zoning district, they felt that, um, 
you know, it wasn't an issue of fair housing. So um, one of the housing trust members who works for mass housing said that other communities are using this provision. You know, it would be an issue if we didn't limit it. Say for instance, they had a project downtown and then you could put it in, you know, on the border of North Amherst or something. But because we have a geographic kind of proximity to the project site, the trust felt that that was actually okay. And they, they actually preferred the provision of offsite units rather than the payment in lieu of because they'd rather see units get built. And so, you know, staffs talked about this and I think, you know, it's a special permit, so it's not as if it's by right. So I think the applicant would really have to prove why they would need offsite units. And then, you know, staff would likely recommend a condition that there be, um, you know, that the applicant show they have site control and they probably receive certificate of occupancies at the same time so that there'd be some conditions, you know, um, having both the projects happen at the same time. So, you know, it wouldn't be like a five-year lag before the offsite units are, are occupied, but, you know, we could have some provisions and, and conditions of permits that would make sure they are actually um, developed and, and occupiable. Love it. Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Amanda Joe. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Doug. Yeah, speaking about loopholes, um, 15.12, um, you have uh, you have a pair of independent phrases linked by and. Don't hear him. Yeah, he was saying um, that fifteen point one two has independent phrases linked by and. Let me just share my screen again. Yeah, yeah. You say residential development means new development on one or more properties developed yep. at the same time or in phases. Yep and that share aspects of the properties. Yep. I'm wondering whether you might want to make that a but, or or rather, mm -hmm. an or, just because I could see somebody uh, maybe taking a large parcel and splitting it in half and uh, developing two nine unit projects on the two parcels and, and not having them share any, uh, you know, aspects and, uh, you know, then they've, then they've, then they've gotten around your requirement. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, um, Doug. Janet. Thank you for this presentation and for doing this work um, on this, um, the IZ article, I feel like we're sort of coming to the end of the road of a long period of try time of getting it right, although we can always make adjustments later. I think it's really uniform. It's very simple. Um, it applies to everybody. There's no kind of dimensional requirements that trigger so someone can go up to the inch and not over it. Um, so I really, I really appreciate this, this draft or this, this um, proposal. But I have, I have a question that I think Kara Lewis from the Housing Trust had sent us an email asking why there was an exemption for cluster developments. And so I was kind of wondering why, because, and then I looked, the cluster developments, the bylaw sections have always sort of daunted me. Um, and so I was looking at it quickly and it seems like under section um, 4.33, if the developer um, provides at least 10% affordable units, they can get quite a huge increase in the number of building lots. And so I was wondering what the rationale was there. Like if, if somebody had a cluster development of like 25 units, um, you know, or do you know what I mean? Like how do these two play off of each other? Why, why is cluster development not automatically required to do 10%? And then it seems like in this case, the cluster development under 433 would get a kind of a bonus of extra lots that nobody else is getting. Chris, you raised your hand. Do you want to answer that? So um, I think that um, possibly in the future, we might want to include um, standard subdivisions and cluster subdivisions in inclusionary zoning. But for now, I think it's too complicated. Um, someone can come along and subdivide a, a piece of property. And what that really means is to create a road put in infrastructure, sewer, water, electricity, whatever, um, and divide the property into lots. And then he might just sell off the lots. 
And there's no guarantee that the same developer is going to be developing all of the lots. And it, need, it seemed to me that um, it really made more sense for this round of inclusionary zoning amendment to focus on developments where the whole development was being done by one developer. So you could capture the 10% right at that time or the 12% or whatever percentage it is that you wouldn't have to um, go on into the future. And I'm gonna use Amherst Hills as an example of a subdivision that's taken a very long time to develop. It was originally developed by Doug Cole or originally, no, it actually was started, I think it was started by Jeffrey Flower back in the late eighties. And then Doug Cole bought it. And um, then he passed away and it's been being developed by Tofino Associates. So it's been since you know the late eighties until now and it's still nowhere near done. It's got, I think, 42 houses out of a potential of 70 in Amherst. If you had to um, track, keep track of which lots were going to be affordable, which lots weren't, um, kind of you know, require the developer to build the affordable units in um, sort of uh, at the same time as he was developing the non-affordable or <laughs> market rate units, um, it, it would just be too complicated. So in my mind, I felt like it was better to leave subdivisions out for now. And then once we get our uh, feet under ourselves and really understand how this inclusionary bylaw is going to operate, um, now that we're encompassing so many different kinds of development, um, then perhaps in the future, we might want to consider subdivisions, but it's just too complicated for now. So. In, in terms of the cluster developments, it is like the whole 4.33. Do you feel like it's too complicated to deal with that right now? That maybe in the future, it would the 10% would apply to clusters and maybe they get their bonuses if they provide like 20% affordable or something? Yeah, so I think there have been a few cluster subdivisions that have you know taken advantage of the density bonuses and provide affordable units, but then it becomes something where it's worked out during the permitting, the land use permitting. And so, you know, usually then it's the applicant who's the developer who's willing to designate lots and really, you know, um, help organize that at, up front as opposed to, you know, not, you know, not knowing what's happening with those, with those properties. So it's something that, you know, is then, you know, like I said, dealt with up front because they're, they're actually voluntarily doing it. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to Shalini. Yes, I wanted to, again, thank the staff for streamlining the process and removing um, the, I think what developers also look forward to is what's predictable and clear for them. And uh, so that's really well done. I also want to highlight again, the potential of increasing the rents by not offering any incentives because I'm looking at research on there's one paper, for example, which I had sent earlier. Uh, it's in one of a series, is the economics of inclusionary development. And just having a business background, my understanding is that uh, when we are asking the developers to uh, offer affordable housing units and they're receiving half the rent or whatever it is that means they're gonna recover the loss from the rest of the units, which means the rents go up in the other units. And overall, does that create affordable units, but does not, but also increases the rents in town? And the way to offset that, so according to this report, it says in most cases, jurisdictions will need to provide development incentives to ensure the feasibility of development projects. Uh, the principal incentives could be direct subsidies, density bonuses, tax abatements, reducing park it, parking requirements. And um, so that's just something either we look at what is the impact of inclusionary zoning in other towns? Did the effects of that on, yeah, we're creating affordable units, but is it also increasing the the rents in town. And when we say there's high profits, we also have to keep in mind the high rents are also because the property taxes in our town are pretty high. So 
My other concern is that it will affect actually the smaller builders because the big units, I think, have enough profits, perhaps. I don't know. But it's the smaller builders who might be more impacted by the inclusionary zoning when they're not given an incentive. Thank you. Chris? So I wanted to remind everybody that we do have a tax incentive um, for developments that provide 10 units or more of affordable housing. Um, we have a tax incentive that provides um, dimin or have, I, I'm not exactly sure how to say it, but it provides a tax relief over a period of 10 years, starting with a large tax relief in the beginning of the project and a smaller and smaller tax relief as you get towards the 10th year. And um, so far, the only developer in town who's taken advantage of that has been uh, Beacon Communities um, with the North Square project, but um, we're hoping that other developers take advantage of that tax incentive as well. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Steve, and then Maria. Hi. Um... So actually a lot of you have covered my comments, but uh, I actually wanna follow a thread that Janet McGowan had brought up. Um, I think that laws and bylaws are fairest when there are no exemptions. So I'm looking at the list of exemptions and um, I'm trying to weed them out. So like the affordable housing exemption, that doesn't seem like that should be an exemption because by definition, this will meet the, in other words, you can't have an affordable housing requirement they're going to be meeting it because it's all affordable housing. So I don't see a reason for that. The conventional subdivision, I'm not convinced that that's an insurmountable issue. So in other words, uh, there was, in the case of what um, Chris was describing, the developer would be compelled to put a deed restriction on, you know, there's 40 parcels, there'd be a deed restriction on what? Um, I can't do the math five parcels, um, and then that bridge gets crossed when those parcels go for sale, I guess. And then cluster development, I think there's been a good description of that. Then even RF, I don't understand fully why that would be exempt because, so RF, we know that what's developed there is student housing. That's where student offsite student housing is permitted. But I don't understand why we'd be giving an exemption for that. I, oh, well, I, I, I'm going to answer my own question because I think that um, students don't typically qualify for for affordable housing. So I'm going to answer my own. I just answered my own question. But anyway, those three, the top three, I would prefer to remove those from the exempt list, and then we can cross the bridge of how to enforce it at some other date. But the last thing we wanna do is to be incentivizing conventional subdivision development. I mean, that's the worst possible kind of exclusionary development. So why don't we figure out a way to make that part of this package now? Thank you, Steve. Maria. Oh, yeah, sorry. Do you wanna respond? Sorry, yeah, I was gonna say with the comprehensive permit project, they may not actually meet the um, inclusionary zoning bylaw um, necessarily. So when 132 Northampton Road came, they actually asked for a waiver from it mm -hmm. just because sometimes the subsidizing agencies don't wanna see that it's, um, that it's subject to other local regulations. And so whether or not we put it in here, most often a comprehensive permit developer is gonna ask to waive this anyways, because they can't be subject to two local regulations. And so, you know, we're just, we're exempting it because in the last uh, two comprehensive permits, they asked the, for this provision to be waived because they see it as like a, as a legal problem that they'd be subject to both. But I understand you, I understand, right? Like if the list of ex exemptions grows too long, <laughs> it's like, well, what are we, what are we capturing? Thank you, Nate. Maria. Thanks, Nate. Um, so I, I've always had the same beef with this and um, Shalini kind of touched on it. It's just, um, and Chris did too, about the incentives and how we mediate sort of, uh, yes, we want more affordable housing, but how do we do it so that we're not reducing the amount of development because of this being possibly um, overly stringent. And I've kind of come around to that with the idea that 
you know, I really trust the planning staff and the planners and the building department um, staff that they have worked enough in town over the years, talked with developers, had a lot of anecdotal sort of examples of what was able to be built, what was proposed and not able to be built to really stand behind this. And that's the only reason why I'm not as apprehensive um, because I, I, you know, I read all these studies about, uh, yeah, what are the incentives? Are there bonuses? And I don't see any. And, and, and the, uh, the one that Chris, you mentioned, you'd have to build almost a hundred units to get that right. Because if it's, you have to build 10 affordable units, that's, I said it wrong. I said it wrong. Nate can say it correctly. <laughs> I think okay. it's 10 units with some affordable units, whatever the requirement is. Oh, not 10 so affordable I units. Okay. I, I was, I'm sorry. okay. That makes more sense. Um, so I just, I, I know that a lot of people have said we could try it, see if it works. And if it doesn't, we'll come back to it. And um, I'm kind of coming around to that just because I would like to see if it works. Um, I don't know how we know that, but I'm sure the planning staff will know because they'll see the projects or developers come and say, you know, this is unworkable or, okay, we'll do this, but um, we might ask for a little more height or something to make it work for them um, financially. So um, I, I still stand behind that. I, I do have a, a worry about the lack of incentives, but that I want to, bring more affordable housing to Amber. I, I mean, like a broken record, I'm always saying that's that's sort of one of the biggest issues that we have where we're trying to work towards. So I'm coming around to like, let's just try it <laughs> and um, and trust that the staff will really monitor it and see that we're not losing opportunities um, and that um, we'll come back to it if it seems like uh, property owners and particularly the smaller ones are saying, you know, this is just too onerous or um, or they're asking a lot for a lot of other waivers or bonuses because it is ours. So, um, so yeah, I, I, um, I, I still have that concern, but I'm willing to just stand behind the staff that's worked really hard on this over the years and um, see how it goes. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Chris, did you want to respond? Well, I just wanted to mention one more thing. I think that um, when this was first put on the books in 2005. Um, it talked about if a project requires a special permit, then um, inclusionary zoning is required. And at that time, um, there was a decision made to interpret the special permit to only be for a special permit for use. But um, conceivably, it could have been it could have gone the other direction. And um, it turns out that most uh, projects that come before us these days require special permits for something, either a dimensional setback or um, height requirements or lot coverage requirements. Lots of different things require special permits. So um, if we had been interpreting the bylaw uh, to, um, to involve all special permits from the beginning, we would have a lot more um, affordable units right now. So I, I feel like we're, you know, it's, it's going to be okay. And the only, um, and, and the other thing I wanted to say was that in the BG zoning district, there's very little opportunity for making, to do any incentives, any dimensional incentives. You can't really make the building um, any taller unless you go to a sixth floor. And I think that's going to be something that people aren't going to want. Um, you can't really give uh, lot coverage um, deviations to any extent because you're already allowed 95% lot coverage. You might be able to do a little bit more with building coverage, but there really isn't much of an incentive to do um, to, to give <coughs> developers in the BG zoning district. There may be some incentives in other districts, but it's... Um, the last time we brought uh, a very complicated inclusionary zoning bylaw to town meeting, it was, you know, rejected, and um, we just felt it was important to make this a bylaw that could be understood by people and could be worked with, and um, just not to make it too, um, in, too impossibly complicated. Thank you, Chris. I. I'm noticing the time and I'm cognizant that I'm sure there are people in the audience that would like to ask their questions. So I'm gonna ask Shalini and Doug whether they can wait on theirs until we've recognized the public and I'm seeing yeses for that. So we're gonna move on to questions from the public. So at this point, 
If you are in the attendees and you have joined us and you have a question regarding the bylaw, not that you want to speak in favor of it or in opposition to it, but actually have a question, please raise your hand using the raise hand button. We are going to start with, and I want to remind people that they will have up to three minutes. Questions in theory should take less than three minutes though. Um, we're going to start with Ted Parker and you should be able to unmute yourself, Ted. Thank you. Uh, I, very simple question. Um, the 80% the and 60% numbers, what do those translate into real dollar amounts? Cur what's the current uh, you know, income? In uh, Nate, do you have those numbers handy for say a four member family? Yeah, I, um, you know, I don't have them right um, off the bat. It, so it, you know, the income, the way the income translates into how much, you know, 30% of your income prorated uh, every month is what the rent should be plus allowances for utilities. So, you know, it's not, you know, you can make under that and then the rent is set. Um, I understand all of that part. I just want to know what the real numbers are because one of the options, if there's a, if there's a payment in lieu, right. you, you're going to, you're requiring a, this bylaw would require uh, four times the, 80% of the, of that income, right? So that's a real number. So mm -hmm. it changes because it's frequently recalculated, but you have, you have no idea what that number is now. So I, what I, what I was going to do is look base, base it on the income or the rent that can be charged at, um, at Aspen Heights, not say for instance, like Aspen Heights, I'm looking at their website. It's not what the income is. So for instance, for like a one bedroom, you can charge almost $1,200 for an affordable one bedroom. And it goes up from there. So, you know, whether what, you know, that's that 80% area median income. And so that's, um, you know, that's, that's the, you know, that's what the, that's what they can charge for rent. Right. Um, but, but, but your, but the bylaw says that a payment in lieu, right. Which is, which you are offering that option would be four times the, 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 that the, uh, the reference income. Oh, right. oh, so yeah, yeah, so four times, right? So the area median income is not based on eighty or six percent. The area median income for Amherst is say seventy five thousand um, dollars. So you're saying it's of Amherst or of the catchment area, the Greater Springfield metropolitan catchment area? I'm confused Amherst. about what you're. So, so the income for the rental amounts is based on the area median income, that Springfield metropolitan statistical area, but the payment in lieu of is just the median income for Amherst. Calculated by whom? I think the bylaw said that. May I answer? I yes, think Chris. I have an answer. So 80% of area median income for a family of four, I believe is about $68,000. Okay. So you multiply 68,000 times X times four. So the Amherst, the Amherst median, 80% of the Amherst median income is 68,000. It's the Springfield I'm, area median income, and we're part okay, of the Springfield area. So I, I think the question has been answered, um, and we, we are going to move on to the next person. Um, so the next is Brendan Bailey for a question. Oh, I have to, sorry, Brendan, <laughs> I forgot to allow you to talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I was trying to figure that out myself. I said, well, this is going to be tough. Um, <laughs> uh, my, I, my question, it's not necessarily a question specifically. The comment that I have doesn't speak directly in opposition or in favor of the amendment, but it's more uh, input from my association. And we've actually touched on a little bit tonight. I didn't know what the appropriate time would be for me to bring that forward. You, you can do that now if it's not in favor or against. Okay, super. Um, well, uh, thank you all very much for allowing me to be here. And do we need to state name and where you're from? And yeah, sorry, I forgot to, to say that. Um, just just state um, if you know your district, what district you're from, if you live in Amherst, and if not, just identify what town you do live in. And if you're representing someone, identify them. 
Sure. So uh, again, my name is Brendan Bailey. I'm the CEO for the Realtor Association of Pioneer Valley. Um, and I live in Longmeadow, uh, right next to Alex's Bagels, actually, if you know where that is <laughs> on Edgewood. Um, anyway, so the comments that I want to bring forward um, are really about its input, not speaking for or against. And um, there have already been some comments directly on what I'm uh, talking about. Um, and that really involves the costs. Um, the current proposal does not contain uh, cost offsets uh, for affordable unit requirement. And we really urge you guys to include an appropriate offset in any final language. Uh, most common, what we've seen nationally is a density bonus, which again has been talked about a little bit, which works to defray costs of the affordable units over a larger base. Um, when this isn't present, uh, developers may not have the ability to finance projects or uh, pass along in they you know, these costs can get passed on to the end user. Um, one thing that we really recommend if, uh, I don't believe this has been done, uh, a financial feasibility analysis can provide a basis uh, for that appropriate offset. And, you know, we would be happy to talk about that. Um, I'm not sure if this body is familiar with our organization. Um, my predecessor was a gentleman by the name of Ben Scranton. Um, he retired previously and I, and I took his place now as CEO. Um, so we're making a big effort for our association to be involved with our uh, 68 municipalities because our association does represent all the realtors throughout Hamden, Hampshire and Franklin County. So it's a lot of area to cover, uh, but a lot of good work to, to do. So um, I just wanted to put that forward to you guys and specifically the, the feasibility study. That is something that we can help with actually um, because we are a local association, but then we do have our state association and the national association as well. So whenever you're going through policies such as this, I know we're a little late to the game in this instance, but we can perform a lot of these uh, studies for you and also through grant processes that we have with our national association and things like that. So we're simply here to be a resource and I appreciate the time. Thank you, Brendan. Um, next, actually, are there any other questions? Um, Nina Weil, um, please unmute yourself and state where you live and then ask your question. Uh, Nina Weil, I live um, in Amherst in District 4 and I've been aware of Center East Commons because it, it sprouted up in, in, in my neighborhood very close to me. And my understanding is it has no affordable units. First of all, is that true? And second, would these, if, if they were in place when they were um, applying for their permit, would they have had affordable housing units? So I, I, I lost you for a second, so I just want to confirm your questions. The first one is whether Center East Amherst has any affordable units. And the second is if this bylaw were in place at the time they were granted their permit, would they have been required for units? Is that yes. correct? Okay, Chris. Um, it does not have any affordable units. And if this bylaw were in place when it was being permitted, it would have been required to have some affordable units. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the public? We're going to recognize Mac user. Please state your name and where you live and then ask your question after you unmute. Hi, this is Chad. Uh, I don't know the district, but it's Steve and, and Evans. District four. Uh, I've been in, yeah, they switched districts and uh, the numbers and all that. I haven't kept up with it. In the 20 or 30 years I've lived here, um, I'd say a lot of it, half of it, I've been uh, following the affordable housing issue in town. I remember in the old day, what I call the old days, um, we had uh, a different figure, um, same as the first question, uh, first citizen's question about the percentages. Um, I've noticed that we've gone from 30%. Uh, most of the language now um, is in the 60 and 80, um, not even in 50 percent of the AMI. Um, because we have such a severe um, issue here with our anchor institution, um, really creating, um, you know, uh, in the last uh, five, 10 years, declining population in BIPOC, 
people who work in town commuting in from Chicopee and so forth. We really need to, since there's a radical problem, we need a radical solution. So I'm wondering why that 30% was, is, you don't see it anymore. It's 60 and 80. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Um, Chris, did you want to answer that or Nate? You know, than 30% of the area median income, that's the... Correct. Yeah, I think that, you know, um, typically uh, to have that low of a, you know, to have an income um, of that nature and the rent of that nature, usually it's a developer who can apply for subsidies. It's not typically a market rate or, you know, most developers aren't specialized to know how to do that. It, there is a lot, you know, there is, it does take a lot of, um, you know, expertise to apply for subsidies and manage that. So, you know, so for comprehensive permits or other projects, they can um, go to 30%. And we're, we're actually saying that the 60 and 80 are maximums. So a developer, if they're willing, they could voluntarily have a lower AMI. We're just not requiring it because it, it is, you know, it, it would take a lot. Um, I think at that level, Whoops, you cut out. I think Nate just froze. You cut out at the end there, Nate. Yeah. Okay. Um, you you cut know. out at around at that level. Oh, yeah, I was just saying, I think at that level, we need more subsidy or more offsets because it is, you know, there is then a, a greater differential between market rate and the 30%, uh, you know, rental amounts at 30% AMI. And I just think that there's not, you know, I think that would be a really restrictive requirement. I think I said that developers can voluntarily go that low but we, it's just not a requirement, you know, the 60 and 80 are maximums. Thank you, Nate. And thank you, Chad. Um, seeing no other questions, we're going to move to public speaking in favor of revision. At this point, if you are in favor of the revisions proposed for Article 15, please raise, and you would like to speak to them, please, please raise your hand um, for recognition. You will have up to three minutes to speak. Um, we are going to, I'm going to recognize um, John Hornick at this time. Okay, I believe I'm here. Everyone can yes, hear me? we can. Okay, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. And I also appreciate the work that the planning department, particularly Nate Malloy has done on this as other people have mentioned. Uh, I think this is the time to do this. Uh, I understand that there are costs as well as administrative requirements that developers have to pick up in order to be able to do affordable housing. Um, I don't think that's an insurmountable barrier. We already have developers who are doing this in town. Nate mentioned Aspen Heights. There are other developments that Barry Roberts has on University Drive that's completed, another one that he's now building. So developers can figure a way to do this. Um, from the little bit of experience that I've had learning about affordable development, one thing that I understand is that there are always problems that come up, costs that are not anticipated, and developers just figure out how to, how to deal with it. Um, these are not an insurmountable, or they don't present insurmountable ob obstacles. On the other hand, would they prefer to have to do these things, to add costs, to add administrative requirements? Well, of course they wouldn't. I mean, anybody else in any business wants to minimize their costs and minimize their administrative requirements. And that's absolutely gonna be true of any developer in Amherst or anywhere else. Uh, one of the former members of the Housing Trust approached the developer in town about voluntarily adding inclusionary uh, units or affordable units to a development that was in the planning stage. And he was kind of interested. And then he got back to my colleague and said, well, you know, I've talked to my banker, I talked to a realtor and I talked to somebody else and they all said, you don't wanna get involved in that. It's extra cost and extra work. So I think that People are not going to do this voluntarily um, because indeed it does involve extra cost and extra work. But again, it's not so much in the way of extra cost or extra work that it's not impossible, particularly when you're renting 
uh, new one or one bedroom apartment for eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars a month, or a th- three bedroom, a two bedroom apartment for three thousand dollars a month. Um, the rental market in Amherst is very, very strong. Developers can't move somewhere else. You can't go to those rents in Sunderland or Hadley or Northampton or East Hampton. If they want to play and get involved in projects of that nature, Amherst is the place that they need to be. So to me, this is a question of values. Yes, on the one hand, we know that it will make development a little bit more difficult for people who go into that business. On the other hand, we also know absolutely that if we don't see new affordable housing through any number of routes, and inclusionary zoning is an important one, then people who need that housing are not going to be able to get it. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I, People in this group don't attend meetings of the Pioneer Valley Network to uh, end homelessness, or you may have not seen the uh, wayfinder. Sorry, please wrapping up. up. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mandy Joe. There you can have all, one more sentence if you want. <laughs> okay. There's all kinds of evidence that we have a huge need, and inclusionary zoning is a way to do this. We don't need more debate. We don't need more study. We just need to get it done. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Next up is uh, Janet Keller. Please unmute yourself, identify yourself, and you can speak then. Hi, thank you um, for uh, the opportunity to speak. And um, thanks uh, to the staff for a terrific, very clear, and convincing presentation. I'd like to add to uh, John's list of groups that, um, of developers that did find a way to add uh, the affordable units, presidential apartments did so. They added six out of 54 at um, that development. And I'd like to speak to the need. North Square was able to, um, uh, with the comprehensive permit, to offer 26 affordable units to uh, households with very low income, um, 50% of area median income. And um, out of the 130 units um, total. And Um, almost immediately they told us that those 26 were snapped up um, and we have some uh, terrific new neighbors as a result Um, and 300 people went on their waiting list. Um, The need is really great and um, I am so hoping that we get this this change because it's a huge need. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, Seeing no other hands in ready to speak in favor, we will be moving on to public speaking in opposition of revision. Um, And before I recognize anyone on that, if anyone raises their hand for that, I just wanna state for those that are joining us for the 8 p.m. hearing, we are getting close to wrapping up the 7 p.m. inclusionary zoning hearing. So just be patient with us as we move through finishing the 7 p.m. hearing. Um, And so we are looking for anyone to raise their hand if they're going to speak in opposition to the revision of the bylaw. Um, So at this point, I'm going to recognize Kitty Axelson Berry. Please unmute yourself and identify where you live and your name and you may have three minutes. Okay, I'll try to be faster. Uh, Kitty Axelson Berry, um, 89 Stony Hill Road. So I just don't think it goes quite far enough. Um, I agree with Andrew McDonald when he was um, giving a cautionary um, statement about um, 
well, well, I forget which one he was. Wait a minute. <laughs> um, I think it's two pro developer in that 500 square feet is actually a football and a half football field and a half away. So like this other place for, you know, this kind of ghetto where the affordable housing could be put is it, yes, it's not as far as North Amherst from the downtown Amherst, but it is a football field and a half away. That's, I think that's really too far and that that should be modified. Um, I also feel that there should be 20% affordable housing, not 10%. And I'm, and I agree with Doug Marshall that it should be or not and in terms of those two clauses of who, what, what people, what developers have to do, um, or how they qualified. And, um, and I hope that these regulations would pass on from owner to owner. And I don't know whether it has to say that or not, but, um, yeah. I just wanted to mention it. That's all. Thank you very much, Kitty. Um, we are next going to recognize Richard Bentley. You should be able to unmute yourself right now. Please identify yourself and where you live. You have three minutes. Am I unmuted? You are. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, I'm hoping that a lot of this zoning stuff is very confusing and very difficult. And there are all sorts of little squiggles and things that people can do that other people don't notice and they like it that way. I'm told that the planning board is going to provide some sort of direct uh, kind of, uh, I don't know what it is, but it, it's a, a direct way of communicating with the public so uh, we can know exactly what's going on because there, there's so much, this zoning stuff is a nightmare uh, to most people. And so I'd like to urge them to get busy with that. I'm told that's something they're going to do. I haven't been told when they're going to do it, but let's get busy with that. Making all of this known to the public in simple, easy ways. Thank you, Richard. Um, Chris, would you like to identify the website that you have created to identify all the zoning that is being worked on? Thanks, you, Mandy. Um, yes, on the planning department webpage, because not all of these things come from the planning board, on the planning department webpage is um, a section that has all of the zoning amendments that are currently being considered. It also has all the documents that we've shared with the planning board or with um, CRC documents that have been submitted from others. Uh, it's got comments from everybody on it. Um, and we could send Mr. Bentley a link to that page tomorrow. Thank you, Chris. Um, we are still looking for hands for people speaking in opposition to the revision. Janet Keller has raised her hand again. Um, I will allow you to talk, Janet, even though I'm confused. <laughs> but you may unmute yourself. Um, I, I raised my hand again because I was confused and I, this technically probably fits into this category, but um, I failed to support Steve Schreiber's suggestion that um, this be amended to reduce the subdivision exceptions. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, seeing no more hands seeking to speak in opposition. Oh, wait, hold on. Hold on. Seeing no more hands seeking to speak in opposition, we will move on to the planning staff. Do you have any final words to say? Yeah, I think the. Um... You know, I think maybe I misunderstood uh, Ted Parker's question. And so I just, um, and um, so, I, you know, the, uh, I can, I was going to share my screen just to show what I pulled from HUD just to, um, you know, if, if this is visible to everyone. It is. The median family income for Amherst, it is calculated uh, based on the Springfield MSA, but it's 81,700 for uh, fiscal year 21. And the 80% income limit, so for a family of four, it's 67,300. And, um, you know, and it's 
you know, it, it's based on family size and the rents, um, you know, are calculated by, um, the, you know, afford affordable housing developer will have a marketing agent and you work with the state to come up with rents. And so for Aspen Heights, actually, which is a new, you know, uh, the Amherst Motel site, you know, uh, the affordable bedrooms are actually more expensive than I thought. So a one bedroom is 1366 a month. A two bedroom is 1537 and a three bedroom is 1700 a month. So the, you know, the market rate rents at 80, 80% per, AMI can still be quite high. You know, there's wiggle room there in terms of utilities and other things. This, these include utilities. Um, so you can back out a number of utilities, but I do think that, um, so, you know, the, if someone were to apply and we'd say, this is what 80% is. Uh, and then that's what the median family income is. So we would, you know, we would go through a process of using a HUD data set to determine those those numbers. Thank you, Nate. Um, anything else from the planning staff? Any other questions from the planning board or the community resources committee? I am seeing none. Um, Ted, I encourage you to email the CRC and the planning board and the planning staff if you have continuing questions about the numbers um, within the next day or so. Seeing that there are no more questions from anyone, um, we are going to take a motion. We're gonna do a joint motion so that one motion gets made, but all committee members of all committees vote at the same time. So is there a motion to close the public hearing? on Article 15, Inclusionary Zoning. Johanna. So moved. Is there a second? I second. And Dorothy Pam seconds. And okay. And so we will take a roll call vote seeing that there's doesn't seem to be discussion on this. I am going to try and go down the list. If I miss any planning board members, I apologize and just speak up as I do after I finish the whole list. So Jack. Sorry about that, I was muted, uh, yes. Okay, um, and then Janet? Um, yes. Tom? Yes. Andrew? Aye. Doug? Aye. Johanna? Aye. Maria? Approved. And did I get Tom? Yes. Is that the whole planning Aye. board? Yes. Okay, <laughs> and then my committee is Shalini. Yes. Um, Mandy is a yes. Dorothy. Yes. Evan. Aye. Steve. Yes. That is a unanimous vote of both committees to close the hearing at 8.13 p.m. Um, the planning board, I believe Jack will try to take this up for discussion and recommendation at the conclusion of the next hearing, um, but that will be up to Jack and you guys when we conclude that hearing. The CRC is intending to discuss it and vote on a recommendation at its May 25th regular meeting um, if the planning board has made its own recommendation by that time. Um, at this time, we are going to move on to the next scheduled public hearing. Um, this is the one that was scheduled for 8 p.m. It is now 8.13 p.m. And I am going to read the statements again. And that is in accordance with MGL chapter 40A, the Amherst Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council holds this joint public hearing on Wednesday, May 19th, 2021 to consider the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw. Please note in accordance with Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. We are conducting this virtually and will accommodate public comment to the extent practical. Um, before I read, I, I will read the zoning bylaw that we are here for while I'm doing that. Pam, can you try to bring in Kathy Shane and um, Darcy Dumont from the attendees list as presenters? Um, so this is a public hearing on zoning bylaw article 16 temporary moratorium for 180 days on building permits for construction of residential buildings with three or more dwelling units by voter petition article pursuant to MGL chapter 40A section five. 
and it is to see if the town will vote to add Article 16 temporary moratorium for 180 days on building permits for construction of residential buildings with three or more dwelling units to the zoning bylaw, which would temporarily halt the issuance of building permits for the proposed construction of any residential building, including three or more dwelling units in the business general BG, business limited BL, or general residence RG zoning districts in the town for a period of 180 days. The 180 day delay will provide time for town staff and a consultant to provide outreach to residents to assist in drafting design standards and to amend the zoning requirements regarding streetscape, sidewalk widths, and green space for new multi-unit developments, building heights and setbacks required in the zoning bylaw dimensional table, inclusionary zoning requirements, the definition of mixed use buildings, municipal parking overlay in the BG district that allows for no parking spaces for new residential buildings and allows removal of existing parking spaces without contribution to a public parking fund, yet allows tenants to secure town parking permits for town parking spaces, irrespective of the number of residential units, climate action resilience criteria for new construction recommended in the town climate action adaptation and resilience plan, if the town is not able to implement amended zoning bylaws addressing all of these areas listed in this section before 180 days, then there shall be a 90 day extension of the temporary moratorium. So that is what this hearing is on. Um, I will go through the process for this hearing again because a number of people have joined us since the last one. We are going to start with board and committee member disclosures and then there will be an applicant presentation um, of the petitioner presentation, and it is being done by councillors Darcy Dumont, um, Dorothy Pam, and Kathy Shane. Uh, there, there will be questions then, then there will be questions from the boards and committees, the planning board and the community resources committee. Then we will move on to questions from the public. Then we will move on to public speaking in favor of this revision of the zoning bylaw. Then we will move on to public speaking in opposition to the revision of the bylaw. Then we will receive any response from the petitioner's sponsors. And then we will conclude with additional questions from the board or committee. And only after that will we take motions to um, close the hearing if it's appropriate at that time. So are there any questions regarding the process? Seeing none, I will hand, um, well, I will first ask for board and committee member disclosures at this time. Um, Darcy, do you have a, you're not on the board or committee, but do you have a disclosure to make? Because <laughs> you raised your hand and you're muted. Okay. I do not see any board or committee member disclosures. So we will move on to the applicant presentation. Um, I just wanna confirm that we can hear Councillor Shane and um, Dumont. So can you each just say you're present? Uh, we've already done it for Councillor Pam, so we don't have to do that again. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay, I heard you both <laughs> simultaneously. Um, I believe Councillor Shane, you are starting. And uh, yes, and we- and I think you can share your own screen. I can share my own screen? Okay. I believe so. If you can't, let me know. Okay. Is this showing? It is now showing, yes. Okay. Hey, I'm gonna start out. We, we're a team of three counselors. And just so people know the origin of this, there is a provision in the Mass General Law that allows 10 or more residents to bring a proposed bylaw. Um, and that triggered this hearing. Um, and my, my role, and before I turn it over to Dorothy and Darcy, is to say why we think they need, there's an urgent need for a temporary moratorium. On, and again, if this is on, as Mandy read, this is on multi-unit residential projects in the downtown and adjacent areas. Um, one thing you should all know is that when we first came up with the concept and drafted a bylaw and the word got out, we were inundated with requests where people said, can I drive to your house? Can you come to your my home so I can sign it. And we had over 200 people sign and deliver registered voter petitions that were certified 
to get to the council to make sure we had enough. We only needed 10, but we, we over exceeded because of the enthusiasm. And I think that's a real reflection on what people's perception is on where we're going and the needs to take a pause, a six month pause. This is a temporary moratorium because we have a real opportunity in Amherst for change. We're already, as we just heard with the discussion of the inclusionary zoning bylaw, this has triggered a new energy engagement of the planning board. The planning staff has been leading extremely creatively with new ideas that are plugging the holes and gaps we have in our current bylaws and thinking about what we want in the future, what designs we want, what is our vision for Amherst. And I think this is motivated. Why there's a sense of urgency is people's experience experience of what is happening, what has been happening to our downtown. When people see large looming residential units downtown um, with shadows, with lack of walkable sidewalks or any public space to greet and convene or even just sit outside the building, we're seeing small businesses be displaced, uh, well-known businesses. And even though they're supposed to be mixed use, the, um, there's been a lack of creativity on what is that mixed use, what's in that down stairs empty corridor often. We aren't seeing businesses being drawn in, subsidized or creation. There's been no parking um, provided by the new buildings because of the zoning overlay, but we're losing parking places. Some of the new buildings have been built where there used to be parking places. So people's experience of coming downtown is they can't find a place to park and there's no provision to pay into a fund to build us a parking garage. And as we, already heard in the first hour, the new units, and there've been well over um, 200, and there's another 58 online to come on, aren't coming with affordable units. So there aren't units that people who are residents, low or moderate income residents of Amherst can move into. So it's a real time to rethink our current zoning provisions. Look at where there are gaps, where there are holes. We desperately need design standards. The plan, the our master plan itself calls for them and says we should take pause periodically to look at where we're going and do we like it. And we've got an amazing planning staff that has already started working energetically on this with a proposal to hire a consultant to start working with a consultant to give us design guidelines and streetscape. And I was at a meeting with Chris Brestup when she was talking about why she felt we need um, a consultant to work with us. And, it's, and, and what she expressed it as a time for a public discussion to examine what we like about downtown and what steps we need to make it better and more suitable to our future need. And I think that's the sentiment. It's not a sentiment of stopping development, but saying how we develop really matters. And this is a time um, out of a crisis of a pandemic, we have an opportunity to make a real difference. And I'm gonna to turn to Dorothy where this is the motivation of doing it now to give us time to put these on the books so they are effective for any new building that comes in to downtown and adjacent areas so we can see something different going forward. And Dorothy, I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about what we can gain by, this in, by taking this pause, by hitting the pause button. Thank you, Kathy. So what does Amherst gain with a temporary moratorium? We want to create housing units, homes for individuals and families diverse in age, race, ethnicity, and income. We want to require inclusionary zoning, affordable housing unit, and multifamily buildings. The one of the things we need to do is we want to respect and build on Amherst's historical, cultural, artistic, intellectual, and educational resources because we really are and should be a year round town. We want to preserve and adapt historic and iconic buildings that help define the town, that let you know you're in Amherst, not in some other vague place. We'd give it, get time to establish and enforce design standards. Building heights, no sunless canyons. The, despite being told that new buildings will barely cast a shadow, you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, just believe your own eyes. One reason people are so excited about this is that zoning is very complicated. Often we don't know what the rules mean, but if you go downtown, you can see it. We see it. So everyone has an opinion, everyone has a thought, and they're saying, wait a minute, we need to pause because our town is changing in ways that we don't really like. Um, we need to have setbacks from the street for safe, pedestrian-friendly, wide sidewalks. 
so that people can meet and greet each other as you would expect to do in a small town. We need the public and private green space on both sides, both North and East Pleasant Streets. The planning uh, department has been working on this and discussing it for quite a while. And I wanna add that the town did not rebuild Kendrick Park so that developers would not have to include outdoor social green space for its tenants. The new playground equipment, the informal sitting areas and the performing spaces, they were made for all of us. The park is there for all of us in the heart of downtown. And what do we get if we do this and reassess uh, our parking situation? We would then support and stimulate retail businesses, services, and cultural and artistic activities that would draw residents and visitors downtown for a lively, interesting Amherst, that one that has been and is meant to be. So I totally support this moratorium so that we can get a chance to get this thing right and get the design correct. And now, Darcy, it's your turn. Thank you. So what would the temporary moratorium bylaw actually do? Uh, first, it would hit the pause button with a six month moratorium on new permits for buildings with three or four more, more units in, in three, three zoning districts, the BG, uh, which is downtown, the BL, which is the limited business district and the RG. So it would allow time to act, develop and implement provisions regarding um, mixed use building, the mixed use building definition and inclusionary zoning, which we see has already, both of them have already gotten a great start and a deep thanks goes out to the planning department for getting started with those. Um, but we have so much more to do. We need to, the design standards for streetscapes. Uh, we need to revisit the parking overlay district provisions downtown. And I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to talk about potential climate action criteria for new construction. Uh, though the new buildings have some green features, we wanna make sure new construction is following the most updated recommendations for green buildings. We wanna prepare the town for the possibility of opting into the state zero energy stretch code that was just passed into law once it's completed. Town staff will be presenting a climate action adaptation and resilience plan within the next few weeks. And it will include a number of recommendations regarding the building sector, some of which are recommended to be implemented in the near term, since we have an emissions reduction goal of 25% by 2025. It'll be important for the planning board and CRC to take those recommendations under consideration for zoning amendments during this temporary pause. Also, the moratorium, moratorium on permits would not apply to new businesses, homes, duplexes, or accessory dwelling units specifically. And the temporary delay could be extended for 90 days. One final note, um, since our first meeting on this matter at the town council, the resident petitioners easily obtained over 880 signatures supporting a temporary moratorium from all over town. And just to clarify, there are two petitions in the packet today. One was gathered via an online petition and one is of folks who signed a paper petition but not the online petition. So the total was around 880 signatures. Many signers took time to voluntarily add their comments. As you can see, people were eager to add their voices. The comments cover the full gamut of issues and are passionately felt. As I've said before, this is an issue that I discovered on the campaign trail and then campaigned on because it appeared to be an issue that the vast majority of my constituents supported, having a downtown where residents want to spend their time. So we officially urge the planning board and the CRC to affirmatively recommend the adoption of Article 16, the temporary moratorium for 180 days on building permits for construction of residential buildings with three or more dwelling units. That, and that is the three of us, Mandy, with in record time, I think. So I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy, and, and thank you for making it short and sweet. <laughs> um, I, I do want to note for those watching that if people have been counting, there are, I believe, seven counselors currently in the pan panelist side because we have added two presentations. The CRC will not be deliberating or debating the merits of the 
bylaw proposal tonight that will happen at the May 25th meeting um, of the CRC. Um, and that is why this did not need to be noticed as a full council meeting because the deliberation won't happen. There will be questions asked and answered, but that is not deliberation. And so I just wanted to make that, clarify that for people who might be questioning or wondering. Um, so with that presentation, thank you councilors. Um, we will move on to questions from the board, the planning board or the CRC. Um, please raise your hand if you have a question to ask the petitioners um, at this time. And I will recognize you as the questions come and the hands get raised. We will start with Andrew. Thanks, Amanda Joe. Thanks for the presentation. It's just, um, we've been getting so many emails. It's been great to, uh, to actually hear, to hear the story. Uh, so I appreciate that. I had um, a couple of questions from seeing that. Um, there was one, I think, um, Dorothy, you had mentioned um, build on our educational resources. And, and when I first heard that, I was thinking like, well, wouldn't, wouldn't student, student housing be a way of helping to build on that? I, I'm sure that's not what you meant. Um, so I was wondering if you might be able to clarify what, what that means to you, building on those educational resources. Well, I said intellectual and educational as well as artistic and cultural. I mean, bookstores, I mean, um, uh, tea houses, I'm performing spaces. Um, we're a town of people who read, think, like to do things, like to create things. And some of that should be downtown. Um, I mean, to go downtown, it shouldn't just be a place you go if you want a drink or you want a piece of pizza. Uh, it should be a place where we can go to mix and mingle, which we don't do enough. I remember, I remember back before COVID, we would have street fairs and it would be a whole different feeling. It would be, oh my God, here's the people. And I know a lot of them and we're all walking up and down. And then maybe there was um, the, um, the aerial dancers or things displaying going on. You realize this is an interesting town with interesting people. But right now, you don't really get that feeling when you go to that part of the downtown. So I'm just saying, let's bring back the liveliness that um, is part of Amherst. Okay, I do miss those days. Um, and then I guess one other just quick follow-up would be, um, how, much, how much is the archipelago new proposal driving the timing of this? Is this like a response to them in particular or um, is this something that, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand like, is this, is this almost singling out that particular developer? And I understand the, you know, the, 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 the concerns people have about their development, but is that, is that really the primary driver for this? This has been on the books since we ran for office the changing of the downtown, the closing of the small shops. The uh, one day we woke up and the Gazette had a picture of five identical buildings filling that whole space. That hasn't happened yet. So people have been coming and writing and calling and complaining about this and saying what's happening uh, for two or three years now. So it's not singling out the latest development. This is responding to a very deep uh, express. In other words, we didn't create the issue. People have come to us out of their concern and upset. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. Kathy, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I wanted to, um, Andrew, clearly yet another building on the scene does make a difference, but as um, the reason there aren't buildings in that whole corridor is uh, some people managed to get Bertucci's, the old Bertucci's declared historical and there was a delay because we did see a wall. So I think the perception is we have a lot to lose right now. Um, we can lose where the new building is coming in. You talked about the building design. You didn't talk about how many parking spaces we're going to lose, that they're not public, but people park there. And uh, the fact that we don't, I had one person say, oh, but they all pay into a parking fund. I said, oh, no, we some towns have that. We don't have a parking fund. Uh, the sense that the uh, sidewalk at that pinch point will never get wider unless we start talking about setbacks and put it in our code that there's a, a moment where you can maybe have momentum for change. And if you don't act, you'll lose it. And we don't have a very big downtown. It could all be lost pretty quickly if we don't think of this. So there is this sense of urgency um, because each one that has happened 
means, means that's that much less we can do. And I just want to say one more thing about education. This notion of a year round economy that Dort, if you look at the UMass schedule, they're, they're here about seven months a year. So if you're thinking about a running a business downtown, an entertainment business, if we don't develop a, something that visitors want to come to Amherst during those other months or we want to come, it's really hard for small businesses to make it. I mean, what do they do the other five months? So there's an interest of in the affordable units, but also what brings people to downtown year round. And, and so the composition of who is in that building and who would want to move into the building is also important. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Thank you. Andrew, did you have, you, you're done for now? I, I, I guess more? maybe, could I, could I just propose just one other final thing would be, um, I, I've, I've lived in town for a long time and you know this, some of these areas have been parking lots forever. Right, like, would we would we rather some of these areas continue to be parking lots for the next thirty years, um, if we can't, you know, if we can't get developers to build it? No, I'll just respond. I think it's not that as much. I've seen some towns do a linkage or a, 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 a linkage fee or an impact fee, is saying if you're not going to provide parking, then contribute toward a parking garage. So we've also for 20 years been waiting for the parking garage. So that notion that you build a public utility that will serve your own interests and it's a direct link to your own the benefits of people who are going to living in that building. So that is the alternative. We don't have to keep a parking lot. I agree. Thank you. Andrew, thank you, Kathy. Tom. Hi, thank you guys for the presentation um, and thank you for sharing your thoughts. I think one of the big questions I have is about the correlation between a moratorium and the results that you're asking for in the end, right? And so if we go through a process with a consultant and they come back and say, we want a hard streetscape with five story buildings. And that's the result. Is this project then not done? Because we have to go back to the table six months after six months. And we have another 90 days where we try to refine that to get what certain people want. Or is this like, what are the criteria for this being a, a quality productive session? And I think my internet's a little bad, sorry. Um, and then the second part is sort of correlating that to your results in regard to things like businesses and bookstores. Like how is a moratorium gonna produce a bookstore downstairs, downtown and change the dynamic of that culture when the, some of the developers are having a hard time finding those uh, you know, people to even occupy those spaces now. So I guess I'm curious about how, where these correlations come from and how this moratorium is gonna produce these results that you're talking about. And I, and I appreciate your results. Like I, I, I agree with that many of those things should be addressed. And I do think we need design guidelines and I do think we need to a more robust business downtown. And I do think that we wanna make a concern, concerted effort for a more inclusionary um, experience and, 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 and living space downtown, but I, I'm not quite sure that what you're proposing is gonna get us there in six months. And I, I guess that's what I'm asking. How do these correlate? Thank you, Kathy or Dorothy, Kathy? Um, I'll, I'll be willing to jump in. You know, I, I think you're right, Tom, it's ambitious. So what, what we're, we've been observing um, in a very positive way is how intensely you all have been working and the planning staff has been working. The town's been talking about hiring a planning director, but I think there's an opportunity to start to figure some of this out if we're not racing against time, if there's a pause. I heard the discussion on the amount of retail space in the new building that's being proposed um, and how small it was. Um, I'm watching other places say you could design a commercial space to have pop-up spaces and flexible use inside. So it can be season, multi-seasonal. We could get we could think of a large space if, if we would say a mixed use building should really not just be an apartment building with a tiny square that we call retail. So it gets out from under. Um, so we could think but of- But does our zoning then say that? Like, is, do we have to say in our zoning that there has to be X kind of space? No, right? I, I mean, think, I guess that's the difference in I like wanting something not, versus- I think the hardest thing is your question about the retail and commercial. I think we could certainly get street setbacks redefined how far away from the road, um, what the, the feeling and look of the building is, uh, some climate action. The hardest is how do we 
this is what every small town is grappling with, right? How do we bring back downtown on, and Main Street? First, we were losing it to the malls. Now we're use, losing it to the internet. So that is a challenge. But I think there's some creative thought. And up here um, in the North Square, where there's really big retail space, it's empty right now. I think there's an opportunity for some creative thinking um, to get ever smaller with no retail space in large apartment buildings, we'll lose it forever. We won't have it downtown. Thank you, Kathy. Dorothy, did you have something to add? Well, I just wanted to say that uh, I understand those are really good questions. And we can't, we are not saying that we have all the answers, but we do know that if we go the way we're going, we'll be stuck with our downtown permanently changed. These buildings will be there for a long time and there you'll have a kind of a dead corridor in the center of town. So in hopes that with the uh, consultant and more work such as you have been putting in and the planning department is putting in, in hopes that we can come up with something better, we're proposing the moratorium. Um, I mean, if we talk about a mixed use building, did we really think that um, having parking in the side on the first floor of the building, is that what we had in mind when we talked about mixed use? I don't think so. Um, so there are a lot of problems. And so we're saying, we don't know if we can solve all of them, but we want to at least give a chance to try in a short pause. This is not against building, it is not against development, but it's a chance to try to look at it again and perhaps with a, a more creativity. Um, there's some new ideas that we've heard may happen at Amherst Works that will be really exciting. There's maybe a new energy in town for doing things differently. We'd like a chance to see if we could apply that to that part of the downtown too. I, I think the second part of my question is a little bit more a logistical one, which is how do we know when this is done? And then how do we know when we need another three months? And then after three months, how do we know when we need another three months? So I guess I'm curious, like what, who and what qualifies completion of all of these items? Dorothy, Kathy, Darcy? Either way, I think that's a great question, Tom. And clearly we, we drafted a bylaw and we got it here to the public hearing. So the same way um, I've been watching what's been going on with inclusionary zoning, it's getting refined. I think those questions could be answered. You could make a trigger point. You could say, you know, what would condition taking it off? They aren't answered in the current bylaw. So I would think that Chris might have something to offer here. Thank you. Putting her on the spot, but I would, <clears throat> I would really prefer not to comment at this time. Thanks very much. Okay, so we 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 have a question. Um, we know that we we would be done after the consultant has presented the design guidelines, and you, the planning board, planning department, have really gone through it and decided what you think is the right way to go. Um, and then I think that we would, uh, you would, or you know, or the staff would come up with a new uh, uh, bylaw and then we would be done. Because, but I do think that's a good question. We certainly have no interest in a process that keeps continuing and continuing and hanging things up. We do not want that. We're talking about a pause, not a series of delaying tactics because we just love the way it is downtown right now. That is not the aim. Thank you. Um, Steve? Yeah, so I have a comment question then a comment. <laughs> So um, my comment is we've actually had two de facto moratoria in building in the central business district. The first one was from about 1880 to about 2010. So during that period of, I can't even do the math, very long period, nothing substantial, no substantial private buildings were built in downtown larger than three stories. The Tucker Taft building, it's the only private building that was built in downtown in that entire period between Boltwood Place and the, the probably the buildings where the Hastings block is. We need some reflection on why that happened. During that more than 100 year period, Hadley was eating our lunch. The, the you know, basically the Route 9 was being developed while nothing was happening in Amherst. So the next period, 2010 till, um, I don't know, three years ago, was there were several new buildings built in downtown. 
And so the second moratoria is the last three years. So nothing has been built in downtown since um, when he's pleasant. So Spring Street has started and was stopped because of the pandemic. But basically we've had three years of this council. Council Dumont, I'm sorry, Count candidate Dumont brought up this idea three years ago. And what's happened? Nothing has happened until, you know, there's a newspaper article about new buildings being proposed. So I myself am very skeptical about, you know, um, our ability to, you know, to meet these deadlines. So that wasn't my question. My question was, how many new units have been built in the downtown area? You guys have that in your, your package and I cannot find it. Kathy or Darcy or Dorothy, do you have a quick answer to that? I'm, I'm not your numbers person, but I think it was like 220, 230. It's, it's 100. Um, all of my information comes from Chris's staff, but it's 170 units are already up if we do. Um, can And then the other, there's another 58 coming on with Spring Street. So, so let's say 200. Yes. Let's say that 200 units have been built downtown in the last 10 years. If those exact same units were built in RN as houses, that would be um, half acre lots. So that would be a hundred acres. So to use somebody else's analogy earlier, that would be a hundred football fields. So we already learned earlier that a football field is a very long distance, right? Five, so um, 500, um, 100 football fields would be used for those exact units that have been built in a uh, very compact area of downtown. And I'm curious as to why there is a sense in, the, in your message that that is not somehow sustainable or meeting climate action goals. Darcy, do you wanna to respond to that? Your, um, yeah, I guess the, uh, the density argument around creating units downtown is, um, you know, it's, it's valid in particular when you have um, um, elements of life that people can, you know, if you, they have food and hardware and clothing and all the other things that people need, you can have a dense no car walkable, bikeable um, situation. Um, but if we're creating buildings um, that are admittedly designed for students and all those students have cars, um, that, that isn't a climate friendly situation. Um, there are a lot of things that we can do to make it climate friendly, but um, uh, density only is uh, a thing if cool. you have the amenities um, to, to accommodate people living there. Thank you, Darcy. Um, Shalini. Yeah, I think I'm um, also following up on what Tom had said earlier that, you know, these are goals we all share. The um, whether it's the planning board, the planning department, um, CRC, the council. And again, how is what you're proposing going to lead to that? Uh, specifically, when we talk about uh, affordable housing as one of the goals, we're already working on inclusionary zoning. How is pausing building, building more building, affordable building? And so we're already doing the inclusionary zoning. So let's remove that from your list, perhaps. And could there be other ways? Have you looked at other ways of increasing affordable housing, like engaging the developers to use PERD and other uh, ways of um, building small starter homes? I know Dorothy has mentioned that she'd love to see communities with uh, starter homes and and that is possible. Has any of you spoken to any of the developers locally to consider those alternatives instead of but and I'm just asking as a question is a moratorium going to result in engaging the developers to provide these alternatives or would a dialogue with them provide us 
more possibilities? So that's one question. And then I'll have, yeah. Um, I, I would like to answer that very quickly. Mm -hmm. We don't have inclusionary zoning yet. We had a hearing today. Mm -hmm. We're going to be discussing and voting it. Because mm -hmm. we're in a moratorium now, there's a chance that we will have be able to pass the inclusionary zoning bylaw before the next building is built. So that in itself, that in itself is worth this, uh, the, our attempt of putting this moratorium up so that not, there wouldn't be another, because we've, we've lost so many uh, affordable apartments recently. Um, when I asked one person, I said, I see you have two accessible apartments. Um, why can't you have some affordable ones? And he said, because I'm required to have accessible apartments. So I have my two, but I'm not required to do the other. If I'm required to do it, I'll do it. So one of our little aims is to get inclusionary zoning on the books before anything else is built. Uh, and yes, I have started discussions with some builders. Um, there's many, many more to go. But yes, I have definitely done that because the idea uh, of starter homes in some way, which is not land hungry, as Steve described, you know, um, we, we're not going to go there to the master plan says we're not going to do um, taking up huge swaths of land uh, for single family homes. So I know that. Um, so you've already answered in a way one of the questions. The moratorium hopefully will allow exclusionary zoning to get on the books and to be applied for the future buildings. Um, but I agree with you, much, much more needs to be done. I totally agree with you, Sharon. And we're already doing that though. So I'm not sure I understand how the moratorium- We haven't the bylaw. We are gonna be discussing it on- It doesn't apply to the building that is being under permit now. It, it-, it That it, one, it, it, what, whatever's the already in the permit cannot be anyways not please. included. Don't argue over each other. <laughs> oh, that's true. Okay. Anyway, moving on. The next question is one more question, and then we'll go to Johanna. Yes. Okay. And the other question is about again um, the businesses. How does in improving the design guidelines and sidewalks bring in more businesses? We already have Blue Marble lying empty. We we know that it's the internet, so. Uh, when I spoke with Mercantile Store before closing, they said the only people who buy from there are the UMass students and they don't have enough business. So it's not, so how is that going to improve rather than having the bid, working with them and they want to put the performance shell or do public market, something like Thorns Market. And so it, rather than alienating our our developing community uh, through moratoriums, is that more impactful in reaching the goals you've highlighted? And I don't see anything that you've mentioned because I don't see how design guidelines is going to lead to more businesses when we could be engaging the building, I mean, the developing community and business community. So if anyone wants to answer that. Do any of the petitioners have a response? I, I would answer it in that right now, if you want to go shopping, do you want to go on sidewalks that are so narrow that you feel that you're in the street? Um, mm -hmm. The storefronts are not inviting. When you go to the top part of town across from the common, we see uh, big buildings. We see that small shops are demarked. They look smaller, friendly. They, they kind of invite you to come in. And it's just a whole different feeling. So architecture does influence how people feel think and interact and design guidelines have, could help create that. And is that the reason Mercantile Score, uh, Store, Loose Goose, all of those? I mean, I just feel like we're confounding the things to create an argument for the sake of it. And is that really what happened? I mean, of course, design guidelines are important, but independently to the goals that you've set out here. Uh, Kathy? Uh, I'll, I'll be short. You know, Shalini, you're not wrong that the, that is the challenge. There's nothing, and just remember the motor, moratoriums that's been proposed just downtown. You can do starter homes all over Amherst if you can find developers who want to do them, um, and they're great ideas. And so that, but if we want performance shells, we've got to have space for them. So I think even the pause button on thinking, what are some of their buildings? Where could it be? That's important. And as you start to think of who is living in the buildings, if we had 
long-term residents, the number of people who told me they were ready to move down to Spring Street when its original proposal was some parking and two and three bedrooms aiming at permanent residents. They were ready to sell their homes, move downtown until it became studios and one bedrooms and really small studios. If that person would be there all the time. We, so that's the person who would be more likely to be there in August, in June, in, you know, in all those months. And that's the kind of thing that we have got to be have time. And what Dorothy just said, inclusionary zoning is not on the books. If it had been on the books, we would have had 30 more units downtown with people living downtown year round. If all the big buildings downtown had had to face that. And as Chris said earlier, for varied reasons, they could be big buildings, but not have it. So that alone is a good reason to at least think a little bit and wait. So, so, but bringing businesses back, Blue Goose, this, this is the big, big challenge that we all have to work on in a cooperative way. I agree. Last, manager, really last, last, very okay. short question about parking. Has anyone spoken with bid because the developers are ready to build a parking garage without any taxpayers' money? But we are, and so are they more likely to offer that once we stop them from building or would, has anyone spoken to them at this point or engaged with them? And what is more likely to get us a parking garage when we talk, go into dialogue with them or when we put moratoriums against them? Mandy, would you like me, I'll, I'll just you do a quick response, quick. Kathy. We, we have not seen that proposal yet. What I'm worried about, and I'll tell you just because the one thing I heard is developers could build it and then tenants could buy long-term leases for spots in it and we wouldn't have a public parking garage. We would have a garage with spaces that had already been purchased. So I think we do need a public parking garage. So if the terms were favorable and we could actually, it would be great, but I have to tell you how, how many years we have been waiting for that. So if there's money on the table and the parking would be caught with a meter, I would love to see it because I haven't seen money on the table yet. Thank you. We're going to move on to Johanna. Thank you. Um, I've been on the planning board since last summer, and I see how long it takes us to deliberate about issues and do iterative processes and lots of opportunities for public comment. And I'm concerned that 180 days or even 270 days isn't enough time to do all the work that you've laid out in your proposal. And so I'd love to hear from you um, about that timeline and potentially the planning department about that timeline. And then secondarily, 180 days or 270 days to have downtown, especially the North End in the condition that it is right now, seems like, I don't know, I mean, it like they're condemned buildings and cracked parking lots. And it's like, it's an eyesore. And I worry that that in and of itself is repellent rather than creating momentum. So would be curious to hear reactions to that as well. Thank you. Um, Kathy or Dorothy or Darcy? I think that we we can't take all the time, okay? Had we but world enough in time, all right? We don't. So we would just have to do the best we can within that time and hopefully get those design guidelines. And I have talent, you know, watching what the planning department has put together this year, it's an incredible amount of work. And they would bring it in and then you guys would kind of knock it down. I mean, uh, I believe it can be done. Uh, I agree with you. Um, Things look bad, but we've just lived through a whole year with the Spring Street looking like a, a, a ghost ship. Um, sometimes change is is awkward. Um, and, you know, going back to the thing with the loose goose, I had thought that some of those places went out of business because the people who own the land said, I'm going to be, you know, we're going to build on this. And so people chose to leave it. I don't, I don't know the details on that. But I do agree that we want it to look better. We want it to look like Amherst, though. We don't want to have everything that, that looks like Amherst to disappear and to find that we've walked into this canyon of, of like dorms. And we don't even know who the people are. Um, 
and they're all the same age. We, if we want diversity, that means age, it means families, it means singles, it means racial, it means ethnic, it means income. And I think that, you know, we are a town that it really talks about our values a lot. And so I think it would be good that we lived our values. Darcy, did you have something to add? Uh, yeah, I, I just want to point out that um, the three of us are not the only petitioners. You know, we're actually the petitioners because we're residents who signed the petition. But we do, you know, I, I almost feel like we should be inviting some other uh, petitioners into the room so that they can also answer questions. I don't know how you feel about that, but um, you know, I, I feel like we, we were asked by a group of the petitioners to make a presentation today, but we are not the petitioners. So the petitioners are the people who signed the petition that was certified, but um, I, I'm gonna ask my question and I will say I reached out to the three counselors because I knew they were sponsors of a similar amendment and I asked them to put me in touch with who would be doing the presentation and they came back with they would be. Um, so I'm gonna take leave to ask my question and then um, I think there are no more committee or board member hands. So then we're gonna move to the public after that. And, and my question is gonna be similar to following up on the other ones. I'm reading the strict language here so I guess it's two questions. It says, if the town is not able to implement amended zoning bylaws addressing all of the areas listed in this section before 180 days, then there shall be a 90 day extension of a temporary moratorium. So I have a couple of questions. What happens if by some miracle, because there's a lot here, um, the council is able to vote on six proposals to match these six bullet points but shoots one of them down so that it is not implemented. Does the moratorium continue on? What happens if um, at the end of 90 days, six proposals have not made it to a vote at the council? Does the moratorium stop or not? Um, what is the intention of the petitioners in, that, in those two cases? I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump in and answer you, Mandy, with um, words I've heard you. We we brought forth this as a concept. If it can get positively moved, friendly amendments to fix things like this, where three out of five or top priorities. Um, but yes, um, I don't think. Um, in my years when I was trying to bargain uh, health change in the United States, I didn't start at my lowest common denominator. I tried to start where I could move. Um, so yes, this could be improved. Um, so what you're asking is absolutely right. You know, does it have to be everything on the list or, or before that shall? Those kinds of things I think can be amended and can be fixed. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I was just reminded that Jack might have a hand up, but he can't actually raise his hand. Sorry for not yeah. seeing you, Jack. I have a small screen. Don't get too many people on it. <laughs> we'll recognize Jack and then we will move on to the next part of the hearing. Yeah, so my, my understanding of, uh, of the, the moratorium is that uh, it's, you know, we're, we're gonna pre proceed with the development proposals that are presented to the planning board within the next, you know, assuming this moratorium was approved, we're going to hear the proposals uh, that are presented to us. And in, in fact, I think if, if bylaws are um, presented, and again, I, I need some, some feedback here from Chris uh, or Nate, but if some of the bylaws like the inclusionary zoning are proposed that the developer will need to incorporate that within their design prior to, you know, our approval. And, um, and there's a number of, you know, uh, zoning, you know, uh, bylaw priorities that are, that are in the mix right now that, that could be uh, come into play. Uh, so, and then in the end, when we're talking about building permits, building permits, um, 
are going to affect, you know, uh, I guess very close to construction, which would be for any of the current proposals will be next spring, summer. So this moratorium seems like to kind of like, I'm, I'm just wondering about the timing of it. I mean, I understand there's a lot of concern, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> understand if, if this is really going to get the job done that, that uh, Kathy, Dorothy, and, and Darcy have, uh, uh, are proposing. Uh, because it seems like, you know, perhaps it should be a, a one-year moratorium, and then that's just like a non-starter for any sort of like, you know, business vitality for, for Amherst. That's just a bad look. Uh, but in effect, I, I don't really think that this is going to do anything with the six month moratorium. Any response from the petitioners, presenters? You're just saying that Jack, because you think it would take longer than that to get through the issues? My understanding is that the, 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 the projects that are in the, in the wings are not gonna get building permits until way beyond six months. And so this more, this proposal is, I, I just am wondering what the point is. It's not stopping anything. I, I believe we had a discussion that um, at a planning board meeting and uh, it's actually in some one of the, I think um, this right here, okay. Um, a pot projects would be subject to the moratorium, okay. And what projects would you do not? And um, projects that are not subject to Article 16 moratorium, it says current applications or applications you expect to soon that are not subject to it, none. So it sounded like everything that you were working on now would be subject to this moratorium. Um, and the projects that are not subject are ones that are already in Spring Street, already under construction. Uh, and a number of these are half built or built. Um, and um, or Northampton Road, which uh, already had a comprehensive permit. So uh, are ones that already have affordable housing. Uh, this is, it seemed to me that it would actually have some effect on not allowing some projects to go to, to completion um, until we get this thing done. And I agree with you, we've got, it's gotta be, it cannot be something that, that just lingers on and gets, expanded and extended because that would be very bad. And that is not our intent. So I'm gonna clear up the question. I know Chris raised her hand, but I'm gonna think ask sort of what Jack was trying to, which is um, can a project that has applied for a special permit, if this moratorium is adopted or even right now while it's in public hearing, can a project that has applied for either a site plan review or special permit receive that site plan review permit or special permit from the planning board or ZBA right now? Uh, Chris, is uh, are you willing to answer a question like that? Yes, um, a project that is being reviewed by the planning board can receive a special permit or a site plan review right now. Um, projects are more affected by zoning amendments that are in the pipeline than they are <clears throat> by this moratorium in my opinion. Thank you for that. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to stay, say, Chris? Because I know you raised your hand. Um, well, projects, it, it's, it's rather complicated. Um, projects that are, um, that are going along and being reviewed, um, and, and Rob can help me out with this, but once um, a legal ad for a zoning amendment is published, and the legal ad for the inclusionary zoning amendment was published. Now we had our public hearing tonight. Um, that means that if that zoning amendment is adopted, that um, zoning amendment will apply to whatever projects haven't yet received their um, permits. So um, the simplest way to look at this is this inclusionary zoning amendment would apply to the projects that are being proposed for East Pleasant Street. On the other hand, there are mechanisms that developers can use to um, circumvent um, the application of a zoning bylaw. And I'm not going to go into the details about that, but it's, it's possible that developer will choose to take one of these routes to circumvent. So 
it's all a very complicated um, kind of thing. And what I think we should do is, um, I'm not gonna comment on the moratorium, but I think we should put our energy, all of our energy into moving forward with the zoning amendments that we're working on and hoping to work on in the future. That's what I would like to focus on. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, Steve, last one, and then we're moving to the public. How long did the 40R, the very recent 40R study take? Did it include a lot of the components that are actually mentioned in these bullets and did it result in a positive town council vote? Chris? Oh, um, we never yeah, brought this. How long the study, study took, the 40R study took? 40R study, well, we started it um, in 2018 and I would say we're not completely finished with it yet. Um, so it takes a long time and um, it never got as far as the town council. I think, sorry, I was just gonna jump in quickly. Yep. So I think that if you could, you know, the same might say a 40R takes like, you know, a year, right? If you really focus on it and you have a consultant and staff and you really put effort into it, you know, it's, it's a months long process to have stakeholder interviews, you know, public forums, meetings, back and forth. So it is a, you know, there is a, kind of an average length of time in its many months. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, at this point, we are going to move on to questions from the public part of our public hearing. Um, for anyone from the public who has questions about the proposed um, Article 16 uh, temporary moratorium, please raise your hands using the raise hand button. When the questions are finished, we will move on to public speaking in favor of the revision and then moving on to public speaking in opposition. So this time really is just for questions. Um, we will, I will first recognize, when, when I recognize you, please when you unmute, state your name and um, what part of Amherst you live in if you know your district. Um, I'm going to now recognize Nina Weil. You should be able to unmute yourself, Nina. Um, yes, Nina Weil, I, I live on High Street in Amherst. And um, I did prepare a um, three minute um, written statement that I was going to read, but listening to the discussion for the last hour, I do have a question for all of you. And what I'm hearing is that you feel that the moratorium is not the solution to the problem, but what I'm not hearing is do you agree there is a problem that um, one East Pleasant Street, one East Pleasant and Kendra Park are a blight on our town? They don't work. The only tenant in Kendra Place is Mass Mutual. That's an international Fortune 500 company. Nobody goes in and out. That brings no vitality, nothing to our town. We have a private parking lot at East Pleasant. What does that do for the public of, of the people in our town? A private parking lot, $200 a month people pay to park their car there. So I, what I want to hear is, there's a problem, what is the solution? If the moratorium is not the solution, what is the solution? I think we have a problem. Thank you for that, Nina. Um, and I, I will say that you can say your statement when we get to public in favor or in opposition. I'm not sure which side you're on. So just, just when we get there, feel free to raise your hand again to make that prepared statement. Um, is there anyone who would like to attempt to answer Nina's questions? Chris, and then Steve. I would just say, reiterate what I said a moment ago, which is that we should work on the zoning amendments that we're currently working on, and we should hire our consultant and get on with our business. That's what I think. Thank you. Um, Steve? Oh, I will try to answer the question from my next door neighbor and fellow architect, Nina. But the answer is no, I don't think there is a problem to the extent that you have presented it. In fact, I think that we've done a great job in, in encouraging um, 
builders to build on what were seen to be unbuildable sites where Kendrick places that was an empty vacant lot with many failed proposals on it. And now it's an attractive, um, I find very attractive home for many new residents in district four. And I, I feel the same way about Boltwood Place built on the loading, basically the service yard of Judy's restaurant. Who would have thought that that could become a place for new residents of Amherst? The debatable one are the aesthetics of what for me are one East Pleasant. So I, I wish that it were more different than Kendrick Place. I wish that the storefronts had opened. So one of them restaurant opened, the other one didn't. I think we'd have a very different discussion if those restaurants had opened. Um, I have no opinion on the what they charge for parking or you know whether or not that parking is is accessible to me because I believe in the downtown parking district, which is probably one of the most sustainable overlays that we have. It's basically a way of encouraging people to build on build up a core of, of downtown. Do I think we can do better? Absolutely. So I think that we have a very strong planning board now, which has a zoning bylaw that they can enforce. And um, it, so there, there's a lot of interpretation in the zoning bylaw. We have very skilled people, um, a wide range of opinions on the planning board. I think that any new projects that come before the planning board is, will, I think I'm, fully confident that this group can, you, you know, help um, interpret the current bylaw and help us get even better buildings. But no, I do not feel the same way you do, um, Mina, about um, monstrosity or blight or any of that. I don't agree with, you know, any of that actually. Thank you, Steve. Um, Jack. Yeah, I, I've said this several times, but that, that mass mutual um, business just gets no respect. I mean, I, again, I have a neighbor that moved to Amherst because they got employment through the mass mutual business that is in that Kendrick Place building, period. And they have a son that's going to be going to Crocker Farm School in a couple of years. I mean, he, he's probably three years old. I mean, I think that's the whole point of what development is supposed to be uh, in Amherst is to bring people and businesses and families to Amherst. Uh, so I'm like, I'm just like <laughs> very confused when people um, you know, disrespect the businesses that are within the mixed use buildings uh, in Amherst. Thank you, Shalini and then Johanna, and then we're gonna move on to the next question. Yeah, I would answer it in a slightly different way, which is that um, before pandemic happened, uh, we saw a lot of concerted effort with the chambers and the bid to uh, create more vitality and with the town also the council and the town staff working to revitalize our north and redesign our north commons with the kendrick park and there's talks about uh you know things like the block party or the performance shell the farmer's market um, and the bid going actively, trying to create now public market spaces. They're trying to be creative, and and in, and we don't want to distract and uh, put more obstacles. Rather, we want to create spaces. And when we really talk, so I did reach out to Barry Roberts today, and um, to understand what are his plans. And he talked about the designs that he created, which I don't know where the building is because there's so many obstacles at this point, but he hired Kuhn Riddle, which is a local architect to create a design, which he thinks people will really like and appreciate and appreciate his aesthetics. If you look at Amherst works, what he's done with that, taken an old building and changed that, or we look at Amherst cinema and his work with that, or we look at what, uh, Cinda Jones has done with the Beacon, like she had many community engagement uh, planning sessions to get as much feedback. So it's, we want to encourage these local developers. So we are punishing everyone. We're painting everyone with the, whether we agree or not. But what we're doing is we're saying, we don't like those buildings, whether they're good, bad. It's a personal perspective. 
you know, Nina does not like it and Steve thinks it's okay. So, but the point is we are punishing all the other local developers who are so invested in our community and they live here, they've lived here for generations and they want to do what's right, but we have to create a space for them to be able to come and share. I don't think any of them will talk today because there is, there's no sense of invitation and cooperation and collaboration here when we talk about moratoriums. So I would just answer in that way that, yeah, Nina, we are working really hard in trying to engage the different stakeholders, including students. I spoke to, okay, last thing, I spoke to a student in one East building, East Street building, because we met on Instagram and he's a graduate student. He's 40 years old. He loves living there. And he said, I'm different, but there is no policing. I asked him, what is your experience? Are there more polices? So we need to be speaking to people and finding out who lives there, who wants to live there. We keep saying we want diversity and we want families. Do families want to live downtown? We don't know that. And so we are working on a community engagement plan right now with Tom and, and yeah, and that's all. Okay. But so, yeah, we're thinking about it. I, I want to remind people to stick to the question that was asked. Um, Johanna. So um, really the question is, do I think there's a problem and do I think the new buildings are a blight on downtown? Um, I think five stories is a very accessible height. Um, uh, so from that, I'm, I'm okay with the height levels. I think density makes a ton of sense. Um, those buildings are creating about a million dollars in revenue for our town that help pay for our schools and our sidewalks and our road maintenance and, you know, the kind of high standards for services that we want. And then, you know, with regard to Mass Mutual, um, I only know this because my husband does data science work at UMass. And, you know, he says that in that facility, Mass Mutual has really created a world-class data science training program for young people. And it's the kind of thing that he didn't really think was possible in a place like Amherst. Like Boston, maybe you can have an incubator for that kind of thing, but it's happening right now in Amherst. And um, it's pulling in young professionals um, who are really up and coming in the data science field. A lot of them have connections to the university. And you know there are 15 people who are employed there and doing interesting important work. Um, and sure, it's a, you know, it's mass mutual, it's a large company, but that doesn't mean that the contribution isn't important and adds to the vitality of downtown. So, you know, do I wish that one corner was set back further from the road? Absolutely. Um, you know, I was just going by the Ulver design building and looking at the overhang um, that's there and imagining how 11 East Pleasant might have an overhang similar to that and thinking how much more appealing I like that streetscape. But, you know, to me, really, um, we're moving in the right direction. We're learning from our experiences. And I, you know, I don't think it's the I don't think it's a blight by any stretch of the imagination. Thank you, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Um, Ted Parker, please um, identify yourself and um, state where you live and ask your question. Hold on. You should be able to unmute now, Ted. Yep. I'm Ted Parker and I live in District 5. I live in, in, in Amherst Woods. So my question for the sponsors is, uh, you know, I manage some commercial property in the area and finding tenants is always a challenge. Did you, while you, while you were formulating some of this, these ideas, did you, cons did you ask the folks at Archipelago about whether or not they were having success at, uh, uh, you know, getting uh, commercial tenants to fill the spaces or why they decided to reduce the amount of space that they were going to devote to commercial or do you have any do you have any feedback from any developer about the success in 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 filling the uh, commercial spaces that they include in their developments? And the, and the second question is, did you consult like League for Neighborhoods or any like uh, objective standard about what makes good development, good infill development? Because League League for Neighborhoods encourages dense building on existing infrastructure. 
um, reducing parking. I mean, these are all like well-established industry standards for responsible dense development. And, and this moratorium seems to fly in the face of them. So I'm wondering about, did you consult developers and did you consult lead for neighborhoods or anything like that? Do any of the petitioners have a response? Um, I can answer very briefly. I certainly attended planning board meetings in which um, uh, Archipelago was asked about um, retail and he certainly mentioned, uh, the, sp the spokesperson mentioned um, difficulty at this time. But, you know, one of the things we're talking about is rents. We're talking about rents for apartments who can afford them. It's also rents, commercial rents. Um, and um, if the rents are too high for the kind of uh, places we've mentioned, they're not going to go in there. They're also in the middle of COVID, okay? We're just getting out, all right? I went into two stores today for the first time ever. So what we've had in terms of the past year in terms of commercial um, may not be indicative of what's coming. Um, yes, we have no one we've read uh, about what are standards. We know the argument for density, but one of the arguments for density assumes local neighborhood services. And we don't have those. We don't have a food store. We don't have um, many things that are, are, that are needed. Um, in a discussion with Barry Roberts um, a long time ago, um, he mentioned, somebody said, we need the, the shoe repair man. I was so, so glad he's still here. And he said, yeah, I haven't raised his rent since the, like the 1980s. Uh, in other words, sometimes to have the services that people want, the people who own the buildings don't charge the market rate because it's a service we need it, but they don't make that much money. So there's... Um, People, you know, builders who have a certain kind of roots in the neighborhood really are, are, are great and think about the needs. And, and some of those we've, you know, Shalini mentioned uh, some very forward looking developers, um, Cinda Jones, Barry Roberts. Um, so, but we're not gonna talk about one group versus another. We're saying some of these arguments were developed holistically. And when you miss certain essential parts, such as stores, uh, for needed things, then the whole concept of the dense neighborhood that's walkable where people don't need cars doesn't, it's, it's a fallacy. So that's it. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, next question is going to be from Susan. Um, please identify yourself with your name and where you live. You should be able to unmute. Uh, my name is Susan Sheldon and I live uh, Mill Lane. And my question is, has there been any post-occupancy evaluation done on any of the archipelago buildings? That's it. Uh, no, thank you for that question. Um, does anyone, if you have an answer to that, please raise your hand. Chris. Well, there hasn't been any post-occupancy evaluation done by the town. Thank you. Uh, does it have a follow-up? Yeah, I'm just wondering why. Do we not require post-occupancy evaluations? Chris? That's correct. We don't require post-occupancy evaluation. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to move on um, at this point to the next question, um, which is, Nina, do you have another question? Dina Weil? No, I'm sorry, but you know what I'd like to just say for a minute? I, I, Jack, I'm really happy that, that your friends found a home at Mass Mutual. I, I don't mind Mass Mutual. I just think it's the wrong place for it. That's all. I thought we were hoping for, you know, some smaller shops, businesses, interaction. That's all. I just Thank wanted to say that. Thank you. I'll lower my hand. Um, at this point, um, we are going to, we don't have any more questions. So we're gonna move on to public speaking in favor of the, the zoning bylaw proposal revision. Um, and so please, if you'd like to speak in favor of it, please raise your hand and I will recognize you in turn. You will have up to three minutes to speak in favor of it. Um, and I will do my best to keep time and let you know when it expires. When I recognize you, please 
state your name after un, after unmuting please state your name and where you live we are going to start with richard bentley first i have to unmute uh, yeah. <laughs> i i just often wonder whether wasn't this all discussed a long time ago and the planning department decided that there will be you know, no additional parking in the downtown. Hasn't this already been done? I mean, there's no parking. You can't park there. And so why would people go there? And, and if maybe they put in some parking somewhere, fine, but where? I mean, this, this whole issue was solved eight to 10, 20 years ago. There's no parking. Thank you for that comment, Richard. Um, we are going to recognize Pam Rooney now. You need to unmute yourself and state your name and where you live. Hi, thank you, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. So I am in District 4. Um, I do support a temporary moratorium. Uh, our, our master plan acknowledges the desired increased housing density in the town centers. And it's very clear about that, but it also says that new infill and redevelopment of existing historic downtowns and village centers will have to abide by rigorous and sensitive design and density controls intended to preserve and enhance existing character. So I want to say thank you to the counselors who sponsored this. I guess I'm one of 880 people that signed the, signed the petition. I do support denser housing construction. I uh, sadly feel different than some of you because I do not like to see negative outcomes for the heart of Amherst. I want some design controls in place um, to ensure what's built is uh, has wide pedestrian friendly sidewalks, it, it, uh, adequate parking for the business visitors and um, also that creates affordable dwelling units as part of anything built in the town. I think the moratorium gives us just sort of a time to build a measuring stick first and evaluate the many, many disparate zoning elements that are, that are under consideration holistically. It's a huge ball of many facets, many interrelated elements that are being handled you know, one by one. Over a year ago, we had the 40-hour proposal showed us you know, initially it showed us five-story blocks smashed up against the existing neighborhoods and lining North Pleasant Street. Um, four months ago, the council directed the 11 different zoning articles um, to the town department, the planning department, and the planning board. This is a lot to, to think about holistically. These are now unfortunately being discussed one by one, yet they have significant overlap and definitely some cumulative effects. We still have no guidelines by which to gauge and consider the outcomes of those zoning uh, amendments. So I would, I, we also unfortunately have no standards or zoning that actually supports adaptive reuse of historic structures. And those are the buildings that in fact give character to a once and former number one college town. I'd like to get to number one again. Um, so I would say, please do vote to pause the per permitting. And I mean, all permitting, not just specifically building permits, but also to include site plan and special permits. And let's get some design guidelines in place. I think we can then, we're, we're, we're armed to give developers a clearer direction. And we're also um, uh, able to give them better direction on walkable and engaging sidewalks and storefronts. The look in the field that's been mentioned before, and also some adequate parking that supports the small businesses and the new residents. Uh, and very importantly, we do want the affordable units as an outcome of the densification of the town center. So I hear lots of comments and questions, but it just it feels like we really do need to just pause, collect our eggs into the one basket, and deal with them holistically. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Um, next up is Sandy Muspratt. Please unmute yourself and identify your name and where you live. Sandy Muspratt on North 
uh, Prospect Street. And uh, I greatly appreciate this motion and support it, and particularly well expressed by Cathy. I find it hard to understand the resistance to a moratorium, a pause. The resistance seems to fail to recognize that there is a new event in town. We've actually seen buildings built under the current codes. And many people, at least 800, are dismayed. Apparently not Steve Schreiber, who would, have, would prefer to have had the Hadley Malls built in Amherst, if I understand his comment. I think it is thoroughly sensible to pause and think how we might do a bit better. This is not against development. It's not against diversity and all those wonderful things we wish could be reconciled. It's extremely difficult to do that, but we have had uh, events which we find dismaying and many people do. You should pause. Please support the motion. Thank you, Sandy. Um, next up is Susan. Please identify yourself after unmuting and state where you Thank live. Thank you, Susan Sheldon again. Um, I'm, I'm a landscape architect. I have a, a master's in landscape architecture and a BA in, in art history. I've had my own design build business for over 20 years. So I've, I'm mainly concerned with aesthetics and creating spaces that are human scale, inviting. I was on the Kendrick Park Committee for over two years from the community outreach, getting feedback from different uh, uh, different parts of our community to vetting the design firms. And I was very excited when a, a major building was going up on the north end of town uh, as a gateway to uh, our downtown. And I was really dismayed at what was built. I felt like it took didn't, it missed so many design opportunities to engage with the park. Um, and both of those buildings just uh, present a flat face to the park. Um, one Kendrick Park, one uh, East Pleasant has door has sliding doors that open with these kind of dog-like gates that are supposed to be balconies, I guess. Um, I just, I, I, it just makes me really sad of all the de missed design opportunities. And I went down there today and I walked around the park and I actually stopped several people and asked them what they thought of the buildings. And I didn't hear anything positive. It was uh, several comments about how they were out of character with the rest of the town. Um, they, they missed the little shops that were there where so much community action took place. Um, I, I, I think, Basically, that's what I just wanted to say is I, I do believe that we need a moratorium and to develop some stronger design guidelines that would ensure that future buildings um, have some kind of nod to our history and the vernacular architecture in our town. Um, yeah, so I, I do support a moratorium. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, next up is Fanny Rothschild. Please unmute yourself and state your name and where you live. Okay. Um, my name is Fanny Rothschild and I now live at 25 Mount Pollux Drive, District 5. I wholeheartedly urge you to vote for a temporary moratorium a pause to take a step back to systematically study what our town needs to bring new energy to its center. Like others, like Susan who just spoke and, um, and this, the petitioners. I think, I know we're having a consultant, but I still feel like there needs to be systematic way to reach out to our residents as to what we want to see. Uh, built right now. To, and I, I don't think that we're going to find that the answer is more student housing smack in the center. It's 
and apartments that unapologetically are designed as student dormitories. I don't feel like anybody's totally addressed that today. And I'm not sure why our town planners are feeling that that's what only needs to be built. And that's what I feel like is, is happening. Um, I don't think that we need more students living in the center of the town. UMass can handle that. Other areas can handle that. And I don't think that more students living in town equals more business revitalization. I believe it's other age groups like young working people, families and retirees. They'll, they'll support the businesses in the bottom of these buildings and in other downtown locations. And in turn, I think these businesses will attract the 30,000 non-student residents who live outside the center. I'm talking business like retail restaurants as well as art and music venues and something like Thorns Marketplace, which I hear is being considered, um, which I'm thrilled to hear. We need a study to identify what other types of buildings are viable besides these student buildings, and then work with developers who will design for non-students. This plan encourages the town to thrive all year round, not only when the colleges are in session. Thank you. Thank you, Fanny. Um, next up is Elizabeth Fearling. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Elizabeth Vierling at 36 Cottage Street, District 4. Um, and I just wanted to say that I think that the issues that the moratorium asks for review prior to issuance of further building permits, I view as the most critical issues in determining the future of Amherst development for equity and inclusion and for ensuring our town is a destination for residents and visitors. I think unfortunately the issues raised by the moratorium were either not on the list of council development zoning priorities or were down very low on the list of council priorities. And I think this was a major factor catalyzing the initiation of this petition. Um, happily, since the moratorium was first put forward, um, inclusionary zoning has made it up to the table as was apparent tonight, and mixed use building is under discussion, though I think the latter is far from suitable in its current form. I think the other issues of critical importance, the design guidelines, setbacks, public space, parking, and further consideration of affordable housing are woefully in need of serious consideration before further development proceeds. I also believe a moratorium is warranted as we consider if the town's vision for the north end of town center is really a plan for a mini satellite UMass campus of student dormitories. Um, there have been statements made that the buildings that are built and that are planned have the possibility of taking the burden of student housing out of neighborhoods. I would question the data to support this given that the students I work with on a daily basis are looking for housing well under $1,000 a month not starting at 1200 a bedroom. And I'd just like to say that the idea of building this student housing, um, that that's going to suddenly make affordable housing pop up somewhere else um, is simply the worst form of trickle down economics applied to housing. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Next up is Ira Brick. Please unmute yourself um, and identify where you live in your name. Hi, I'm Ira Brick. I live at 255 Strong Street, District 4. I sent a letter to you all with some excerpts from Amherst Annual Report from 1986 and 88 about the two-year moratorium that happened then. That pause was enacted to create the opportunity for improvement where public input and more strategic study aimed at solving problems of overdevelopment, lack of affordable housing, whether we could provide essential services, including clean water, as well as public open space to that growing population. 
The town's annual report after the two-year moratorium was done reported on the creation of a phased growth bylaw that addressed the rate and type of growth that could happen, but also attracted national attention from other towns and cities and even a feature in planning magazine. Briefly, that bylaw rewarded or penalized proposed projects by how well it met criteria. It was reported that there was an, quote, increased sensitivity by some developers to the protection of open space and provision of affordable housing, unquote. The annual report also said that Amherst had, quote, greater control over development proposals allowed for imposition of conditions by the board to ensure the site is developed without harm to the surrounding areas, unquote. I wanna also mention that in the 1988 report at the end of the moratorium, it said, quote, the growth of the town continued apace and subcommittees of the planning board focused on growth management issues, locations for a parking garage, as well as cluster housing, affordable housing incentives and research parks." Unquote. In our town's master plan, it's strongly recommended to include the public's perspective in the planning process. We take great pride in Amherst that learning is baked into our town's economy and culture. I'd hope a moratorium, a pause for thinking, would be a time where we can benefit from the magic of representative government and recognizing that old adage, all of us are smarter than any of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. Next up is Meg Gage. Please unmute yourself, identify yourself and where you live. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mandy, and thank you, everyone. I'm Meg Gage. I live in District 1 on Montague Road. Um, it's really, uh, I'm going to put on my little timer so I don't go over the time. Um, it's really tempting to try to respond to what I've heard because there's so many, uh, never mind, I'm not going to get my timer. Mandy, you'll have to keep time. So many things uh, to respond to, uh, but I'm going to stick to what I had thought I would say. I wanted to respond to three of uh, Congress Councilor Ross's points in opposition to the moratorium, but particularly the first. The three are the three that he raised in opposing the moratorium are the potential to jeopardize future in economic investment, the potential to jeopardize future state funding, and the uh, potential uh, to exacerbate inequalities in our town. I, I point out these are all potentials, which means they're neither true nor false, they're just like potentials. The potential to jeopardize our future economic investment in Amherst is the one that interests me the most. The argument that developers will develop will abandon Amherst if we pause to consider all options puts all power in the hands of developers and prioritize, prioritizes what is most profitable for individuals rather than what is in the best interest and the common good of Amherst. Amherst is a treasure and one of the very, very few downtowns in Western Mass where there is an opportunity for development. We, there are many and varied economic opportunities for revitalizing our downtown as well as our village centers. We have a great hand to play and we should be in charge of what happens, not kowtowing to what developers say they need us to do for them to be profitable. We are not supplicants. We need to take charge of exploring opportunities that will enliven our downtown, for example, services that people can't buy online, as well as more arts and cultural resources. If we flood our downtown with students, students, I feel the opportunities for serious arts facilities, for example, will diminish. A few words about Amber Cinema that I know a fair amount about. Amber Cinema is not kept afloat by students. Amber Cinema was not created because it would be profitable. It was created because Amherst residents wanted an independent film house. We raised 3.5 million and worked in partnership with a very creative and generous developer. Uh, we, created, we created the vision, the strategic partnership and made it happen. I feel we need to pause and take time to envision how we can be in charge. A couple of examples, I mean, maybe we wanna create a little committee of creative people to come up with ideas. For example, if six, let's learn more about the Thorns Market business plan. It's very profitable and lots of small businesses are making. Let's explore how we might develop RFPs uh, to create the kind of businesses that we want. Let's explore creative ways of building downtown arts and cultural facilities in partnership with developers. I don't know how I'm doing with my time, Mandy, because I didn't put on my thing, but 
You have about 30 seconds left. Uh, I'm just going to point to jeopardize the future state funding. Councillor Ross should specify how the six month moratorium makes us ineligible for grants after that period. Seems like they're always state grants. The really, his third point, potential to exacerbate inequalities in our town. This is a scare tactic and an unfortunate and really sad attempt to gaslight moratorium supporters as reactionaries with implications of racism and prejudice against low income families. People supporting this moratorium are not trying to build more upper middle class homes. They're not opposed to affordable housing. Uh, this is a really unfair and false and extremely unfortunate um, line of thinking. Zoning regulations are for the long haul for the buildings they govern. We, to say that a more, you know, 180 days is nothing. Uh, 180 days is a trivial length of time compared to the long term. And we need to think about the long term. These buildings that we're talking about building are going to be there for decades. I hope I didn't go over my time. Sorry. Thank you, Meg. I was a whole bunch I didn't get to, but I'll I'll send you a letter. Feel free to send <laughs> send both the planning board and the CRC um, okay. email um, or email it to me, and I'll make sure it can get to Thank you. both bodies. My, the house I grew up in on North 220 North Pleasant Street, for example, is a historic house. And you could build a beautiful four-story building behind it and keep the front. Please conclude, uh, Meg. Anyway, I'll send you a letter. Thank you, Meg. Um, okay. Um, I, I realized as Meg was talking that there are people that would probably be wondering how many attendees we have had for this. Um, and right now we're around 44 or so. I think I wasn't paying attention to see how high we got, but I think it was in the 44 to 50 range um, for 51. this hearing. 51, thank you. Um, and for the IZ hearing, it was somewhere around 30 at the high, I think, um, before we started getting people in for the next hearing. So I'm gonna recognize Janet Keller now. Please unmute. There you go. Thank you, Janet Keller, District 1, Pulpit Hill Road. Um, I hope that you hear that uh, eight, 880 people spontaneously are asking you to consider this moratorium and that they are asking you to support them in providing and ensuring that there's room for them in a more welcoming downtown than we have now and to explore that um, with uh, the consultant and, and to enable the consultant to do whole, holistic and systematic um, examination of what it is that makes 880 people really uncomfortable in the downtown. Um, um, we're glad that Mass Mutual has done well and is training young people um, in new skills. And we still want buildings that make us feel welcome, that have inviting exteriors with plenty of glass and doors opening onto the street and in buildings that um, are set back on sidewalks that allow us um, enough room to walk with uh, friends and family and, and have enough room for trees and benches and tables for outdoor dining. Um, we do want to ensure that we get the affordable units. And that's one way to increase the diversity, not only of, of the economic uh, 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 qualities of the, of the people, but also um, BIPOC. I've been working with um, aff affordable housing with the Amherst Community Land Trust. And we have brought several families uh, of, of, uh, of color in 
into our housing. And, and we need that if, if uh, we need the affordability if we want to get the diversity. Um, and finally, we need to protect our public parking. The recent downtown buildings were built or permitted with very few, I believe only 34 spaces for a total of 229 units either built or permitted. Um, and residents of these buildings are parking in the Boltwood parking garage and on Prey Street and driving demand for another um, parking garage, which, uh, you know, then would be paid for with public money. That does not compute. Um, and we also need to look at, um, during that period, um, updating the green building standards to the ones that the town is adopting um, with zero energy and the, uh, the new stretch code. So um, I hope you will hear the voices that are asking you to consider their concerns. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Janet. Next is Matthew and Judy. Please unmute and identify yourself and where you live. Hi, uh, this is Matthew Mattingly. I'm in South Amherst. I'm the Matthew part of Matthew and Judy. Um, I would like to advocate for the moratorium very strongly and for having a concerted effort to look at our design practices. And especially I would like to advocate for physical accessibility because this is something I've looked in the town um, master plan and so on in the documentation. I see that there is plenty of references to accessibility which I think is really important and I like that. But I also know that it's possible for a building to be um, you know, accessible on paper and in the eyes of the law and not really be accessible. It has to be accessible um, when the weather is bad. It has to be accessible when it's crowded. There's more to it than just having the, the right number of parking places and so on. And accessibility should really be addressed holistically that it affects the, you know, the town services, the town sidewalks, the parking places, the cutouts, all those things, and the way that the buildings are designed all have to work so that somebody can get off the bus or get out of their car and get into the building. Um, and it, I know that accessibility is something that's in the law and it's something that you will be looking at, but I also know that historically it's easy for it to get swept under the rug or pushed aside by things that are more, um, more sexy at the time. Like, you know, if we want to have green buildings, that's great. We want to have buildings that look good, that's great. We want to have buildings that are, are appealing to many different people, that's all great but those things have to be um, all done in a way that's accessible. And in general, accessible design, if it's good accessible design, is just plain good design. It's beneficial to everybody that uses the buildings or the facilities. So I just wanna advocate for that being kind of top of mind as we deliberate about the, um, the design uh, criteria for these buildings. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Next up is Robert Greeny. Please unmute yourself and identify yourself and where you live. Hi, I'm Bob Greeny. I'm on McClellan Street in District 3. And uh, I think the, the points that I would want to make have all been made. So I just want to speak briefly saying that um, I really support the moratorium. This very meeting is a good example of what the moratorium can do. It can give me a greater sense of connection to what's going on. I can hear people I disagree with stating their case. The trend, the trajectory downtown is dis disliked by a lot of people. That's obvious. The moratorium is a way of saying, we hear you. We're going to listen to you. We're going to make an effort. 
to do things better. We're going to make an effort to have the bylaws, the standards that we use to guide our building more reflective of all of us and not so further seeds of division. We all live here. We see each other. We know each other. We want to get along with each other. We don't want to be bad mouthing each other. We need to try harder to respect each other's position and find a compromise that works and builds greater consensus in our community. I really hope, we, I think the moratorium would be an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. At this time, we are going to move on to, seeing no other hands, we're going to move on to public speaking in opposition to revision. Again, if you would like to speak in opposition, please raise your hand um, and I will recognize everyone in turn. You will have up to three minutes to speak in opposition to the revision and proposed revision. Um, and uh, when you do get recognized, please state your name and where you live before you start speaking. Uh, we're going to start with Sarah Marshall. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, like others who have spoken, I care what our new apartment buildings look like, but I care more about adequately funding our local schools. <clears throat> I care how wide our sidewalks are, but more about adequately funding repairs to our, our existing sidewalks and roads. I care about the height of new buildings, but more about preserving subsidies that allow kids of financially stressed families to participate in our recreation and after school programs. In sum, I care more about strengthening our town's finances so that we can address people's needs than I do about the aesthetics. And I care most about creating an environment that welcomes and supports local businesses by welcoming people of any age who want to live in our village centers. I urge you to vote against the proposed moratorium, which could cost us more than we realize. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Brendan Bailey, please identify yourself. Um, unmute, identify yourself and um, uh, identify who you represent too. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for having me speak again. Again, my name is Brendan Bailey. I uh, live in Longmeadow. However, I am the CEO for the Realtor Association of Pioneer Valley uh, and our association represents the realtors in Hamden, Hampshire and Franklin County. Um, so what, speaking against the uh, moratorium, it's been our experience. And when I say our experience, I mean, with our um, partners at the state level, the Massachusetts Association of Realtors, as well as the National Association of Realtors. Um, it's been our experience that housing development moratorium uh, does not help communities meet diverse needs and they can negatively affect local economies. Um, we respectfully urge you to continue to import uh, your important work without freezing the housing landscape. Uh, the big thing that really stood out to us is that Amherst can already decide which proposed housing developments are good for the community without imposing the moratorium. None of the housing developments subject to the proposed moratorium are allowed by right. Uh, the board can determine whether a proposed project adds value to the community or if it should not proceed. Um, so our objection is pretty, pretty short and sweet. Um, there is a process of uh, site plan review and the board can ensure that development aligns with the character of the neighborhoods and the town's long range vision. So there are uh, mechanisms in place and we speak in against against the, uh, the moratorium. And thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Brendan. Ted Parker. Thank you, I'm Ted Parker and I live in District 5. Um, I, I, I have to call this effort disingenuous. I, I think that it is clearly an attempt to thwart Archipelago's development, the timing of it, the fact that no, nobody at Archipelago was consulted. I mean, I, I agree with, with uh, Mr. Brick that, you know, we're smarter together. And I'm a little appalled that 
this was is being proposed without consulting the developers themselves. I think it's I think it's irresponsible and I think it's it's lazy <laughs> actually. And and it, it clearly is an attempt to to um, to to stop development for a while while other other strategies are developed. I it you know a thousand people who don't like the way downtown is being developed, no matter how loud they are are not a majority of people in town. And I think there's plenty of people in town who just aren't motivated to come and argue about it, who see nothing wrong with the development downtown or see not enough wrong to want to stop it cold. And I, it, it, it surprises me that this such a hastily and ill thought out proposal is actually being considered. Um, and it just seems like the same kind of obstructionism that that doomed town meeting <laughs> to be perfectly honest thank you thank you ted erica zikos hi thanks um erica zikos i'm also in district five and um, i will also um, speak against a moratorium um, i worry that any moratorium will um, harm our relationship with our local developers and their willingness to invest. I worry that any time um, in moratorium is too long and that six to nine months is not actually long enough for the selection of a consultant, a legitimate study, uh, work by our staff to propose changes, uh, public out outreach and to implement change. I worry that zoning here is being asked to carry the burden for decisions about the public way and decisions about the type of business tenants that a developer would choose. Um, I think that regardless of the outcomes that there will still, they'll still meet with a variety of opinions um, and that we have really good changes to the zoning um, code in the works already. Um, we've had parking study that recommends a garage and have developers interested in the project. Uh, I love some of the ideas that have been shared tonight um, and share a desire for um, affordable housing and for the arts in our downtown. And I don't see any reason why those ideas can't move ahead within the zoning um, that, and the amendments uh, that we have and have already been proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, Nicola Usher. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Nicola Usher, District 1. Um, I encourage you not to vote for this moratorium. I think it's short-sighted and regressive. There's a lot of talk about working people. Um, I have to say, as a working person with a young kid, um, very few of us are able to attend a hearing that goes until 10 p.m. Uh, to, to say our piece. Um, I also would be curious how many working people signed the petition for the moratorium. Um, also hearing a lot about people of color, wondering how many people of color signed that um, as opposed to how many people signed um, the, the sort of the counter statement. Um, I'm not an economist, but I wonder how we could even be considering doing this coming out of a global pandemic. Um, we should be so lucky if anyone wants to invest in building anything downtown right now. Um, you know, there's there's all this, it, it, it's stopping and thwarting development with all of this talk about small businesses, but no constructive information or reasoning on how this would actually result in there being an influx of shops. Um, one of the counselors, I believe Councillor Shane mentioned something about um, now being the time or being stuck with it, or actually, I'm sorry, I think this was Councillor Pam, um, uh, stuck with a downtown changed for good. I want downtown to change. I want more things to do. I want more reasons to go downtown. Why is change bad? What are we protecting? Um, Darcy, Councillor Dumont said density is only a thing if you have amenities to support the people living there. How is a moratorium going to create these amenities? And what's so bad about students living downtown? We don't want them in single family homes as our neighbors, but we don't also, but they also can't be downtown. It would be comical if it wasn't so insulting and discriminatory. Um, also, if they're living downtown, they're gonna spend money downtown. But also we don't get to socially engineer downtown. Um, 
you know, I think that proponents want a moratorium because they want nothing to happen um, and nothing to change. And we need to confront that reality because six months isn't going to make that go away. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Nicole. Um, with that, we are ending the public speaking portion. I appreciate everyone sticking with us through 10 p.m. at night. Um, we are now moving on to the next item, which is the petitioner applicant response. Do counselors Pam, Shane, or um, Dumont have anything they would like to respond to or say at this point? Um, I'll, I'll just, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for their time. Um, it is really late at night, and I can't tell you how thrilled we were to be preceded by inclusionary zoning, because I think one of the, the words moratorium sped a lot of things up. So it had an impact just by saying, let's, oh, what, what Chris was saying, what we really want are some changes in the zoning law and some positive changes. So that's important. But I would really encourage people to look, um, Darcy uploaded the comments we got of people who signed there are a huge number of people that are very pro-development. They want growth, they want change. So it is not a keep things the way they've always been. I realize there are people who would like to keep them. It is a sense of taking hold. So I just leave you with that thought and whether moratorium is the only way to do that as opposed to a package, what Pam talked about of holistic changes where we think about them all together and how they interact. And that's in the planning board's hands as well as staff. So I do, I do think this is a moment. I watched, I had two main towns that I looked at, Seacoast. One decided to take hold and the other didn't of where they wanted to go. And one is prosperous and the other is not. So there are moments, Dartmouth, some other towns have taken hold. So I think we could do this. Whether we can do it in six months, I don't know. Thank you, Kathy. Um, Darcy or Dorothy, would you like to say anything at this point? Just a few brief things. Um, I don't really like having a defeatist attitude that says whatever comes our way, we have to take because we'll never have another chance. And I don't believe any of us have ever said we're against change, but we said we didn't want to have the town change so much that we didn't know that it was still Amherst. Um, the thought of uh, Amherst being a special town is very strong and there's no reason that it can't continue to be so. But some of the changes that have been happening are not ones that we think are going in the right direction. So it's time to have a pause to time to think, time to give the planning department, planning board, CRC, time to deal with this. We have about four or five uh, zoning bylaws which are in deeply in process to get through at least some of those. Can we solve all the problems? No, but um, some of the arguments against the moratorium were just reaching and creating straw men which they disposed of. And I, I ask you to think a little bit deeper and understand that we are not saying nothing should change. It's great the way it is. Or we hate everything that's happening. or We don't want a new building or we don't like students. That's not what we said. It's not what we said. And it's not what we have been working towards, which is a town which is, you know, I, I hate to quote this because, but it's really, you know, a town where it's for everybody and a place where all of us want to be. Um, I think we're moving in a direction which is making that challenging. So uh, I'd like the rest of the town around Kendrick Park to be the kind of place that looks like it has a park, has children, has families, and wants to get outside and do something artistic and creative together. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Darcy, do you have anything to add? I'm going to assume the lack of unmuting means not at this time. No, no. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> quickly. Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to thank everyone again for coming. And I especially want to thank the planning department that has worked hard on this for a long time. They, they had um, some very good plans in the making way back in September of 2018. And I, and I, I think that I have a lot of confidence that that um, we're going in the right direction. And I hope that the planning board and the CRC will uh, really spend time looking and looking at the comments that people have made. And um, I guess I just really feel like 
um, the parties are not that far apart, that, that, that it, it won't be that much of a reach to, um, to come to uh, agreement and uh, solve some of these problems, um, and probably sooner than what we think the time would take. So anyway, I want to thank you again, and I hope that you will strongly consider the moratorium. Thank you, Darcy. Are there any further or final questions from the planning board or the CRC? Please raise your hand if there are. I'm gonna try and make sure Jack's on my screen so I can see him too. <laughs> uh, Steve. Are we taking comments or just questions? Questions, no comments. Okay, I'll pass. Okay. Um, Chris, did you have anything? I um, have a question about the process afterwards. So what I'm going to ask you is when you close the public hearing, don't all scatter and let's talk a little about process and dates and um, procedure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, any other further questions from the planning board or CRC members? Seeing none, um, at this point I will take a motion we're going to do this motion again fully jointly. Um, so a motion to close the public hearing on proposed zoning article 16 temporary moratorium. Is there a motion, Doug? So moved. Is there a second? Is that Andrew for a second? I will second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any comments? Seeing none, we're gonna do a vote. I will try to make it through the uh, planning board again without Missing anyone, uh, Jack. Uh, yes, please. Um, Andrew. Aye. Tom. Aye. Um, who's next? Johanna. Aye. Maria. Yes. Uh, Janet. Did we lose Janet? We lost Janet at some point. So Janet. Janet yeah, Janet had told me uh, prior to the meeting that she was not feeling her best okay. and that she might exit. So okay, we and, lost her. Yep. No, nope, that's totally understandable. And did I get Doug? Aye. And I think that's all for the planning board. Um, and so CRC is uh, Mandy is an I and Dorothy. I. Evan. I. Steve. Aye. Colony. Hi. Did I miss anyone at all? Okay, so that is unanimous with one absent, um, which is Janet. And so the public hearing is closed at 1017. Um, at this time, I know it's really late. Um, I will say that CRC will discuss and vote on a recommendation on this on its May 25th regular meeting if the planning board has already voted and made its own recommendation. Um, CRC's policy is to wait until it has a recommendation from the planning board before it makes its discussion and recommendation. Um, with that, I know Chris wants to talk about going forward um, with timings and plans and all. So before I adjourn the CRC meeting um, and hand this back to Jack to determine whether the planning board's going to discuss anything tonight at 1018 or not. Um, Chris, did you want to mention anything about timing or anything? Yes, um, I wanted to make a recommendation to Jack that we not discuss this tonight because I think it's very late and we wouldn't have a very rich discussion. And um, so I, I hope that Jack will consider that. But with the idea that the CRC would like to vote on um, May 25th, I wonder if there's flexibility there. And I was gonna ask Mandy Jo, how, uh, what is our deadline? Do we have, um, I'm afraid I'm a little foggy on this. Is there 60 days after the public hearing closes in which the town council can um, take a vote or what is, what is the rule about that? Yeah, so the council has up to 90 days from the close of the public hearing to vote. Um, if it does not vote within 90 days of the closure of the public hearings, a new public hearing needs held. Um, so it doesn't require, it's not like the bylaw fails under state law. It's just, it needs a new, a new hearing needs scheduled and, and held. Um, so the referral to both
bodies was that after the public hearing was held, um, we needed to get, CRC needs to get to the governance organization and legislation committee, its vote and recommendation and language on the bylaw by 60 days, within 60 days. So, you know, our tentative plan is to discuss this for CRC on May 25th, but if the planning board has not had its discussion yet, it will wait until whatever the first meeting after the planning board's discussion is until it does its discussion. Um, May I speak? Yes. So I was going to make a recommendation to Jack that he consider holding a planning board meeting on June 9th. Um, the planning board is already meeting on June 2nd, and that whole night is going to be filled with the new building that's being proposed for downtown. Um, and then they're meeting on the 16th, which seems a little far out into the future. So I wondered if the planning board could muster itself to meet on June 9th to discuss um, inclusionary zoning and um, the moratorium and come to a vote and then um, pass that vote along to the CRC and then the CRC could meet um, after that. I know Evan raised his hand, but Jack first and then Evan. Me? Yes, Jack. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, for whatever reason, I, I'm, I'm good with, you know, powering through this. I mean, I, we, we've heard everything and I think the, I think we could collect the votes on these two articles, um, but I will, you know, we'll do a straw poll uh, for the planning board members. And if we want to uh, adjourn uh, after, you know, uh, the hearing, joint hearing with uh, CRC uh, uh, is concluded, then that's, that's fine. But I'm willing to throw that out there, uh, Chris, with regard to just, having some discussions and then a vote on each because I did, I, but let's, let's do a straw poll, you know, with the board for tonight on these, on these issues. So before that happens, I want to recognize Evan and then determine whether CRC can adjourn. Evan? Uh, in response to Chris's suggestion and <clears throat> remind me if I'm getting the dates wrong, Mandy, but I believe June 9th is when CRC had scheduled interviews for planning board appointments. Um, and there are members of the planning board currently serving who are up for reappointment. So I'm not sure a June 9th meeting for the planning board would work. Thank you for that reminder, Evan. Um, yes, there are potentially two members of the planning board that, that would need to attend those hearings. The, the interviews, the interviews are currently scheduled for 7 p.m. to start. So um, are there any other questions? Uh, Chris, for CRC, before I adjourn CRC, I, I will just make the statement that CRC will modify its schedule on when to discuss these recommendations based on what the planning board decides. Um, I think you've given me good information, Mandy, that um, it's not, um, there's, there's not a lot of urgency in the next couple of weeks to get this done, but um, maybe we can get it done tonight. I just wanted to know what the, what the deadlines were. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, unless there's anything else from the CRC committee, um, there's nothing else on CRC's agenda. So CRC is going to be adjourned at 1022 PM. I pass the gavel back to Jack to take his straw poll and everything. Um, I would ask Pam to move um, anyone, I, I'm going to, I don't think me leaving as co-host will affect the meeting, but um, remove me as co-host and then move anyone that is not on the planning board. So the seven counselors into the attendees, if they have not left um, is what I will ask Pam. I'm just, and I am just going to leave and say thank you to everyone. Oh my <laughs> Kathy. I love the idea that you are willing to power on, Jack. But thank, you <laughs> thank you all very much. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, Mandy, I'm going to uh, remove your co-host. I don't want to hit leave until I know I'm not going to kill the meeting. <laughs> Hi, everyone. The, yes, the night is young by planning board standards. <laughs> so put me in the attendees, please. Yes, and same with me, Pam. Okay, happy to. So.
So, uh, Andrew and, and Marie, you, ha you have your hands up. I mean, I I'm thinking, do you want to take a five minute break or? Um, oh. We could do a straw poll, whether we just want to, you know, take this up at a later date or uh, for whatever reason, I, I, I have some energy <laughs> at this late hour. So, uh, Andrew? Yeah, I would say we don't have Janet here. And then also, I, 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 I don't feel as compelled to rush through this either. I think that uh, we got a lot of information tonight that I, I'd like, like to process. So I, if we went to straw poll, I would say to not okay. continue this tonight. And Maria? I'm ready to vote. You're ready to vote. Okay. Uh, Doug? I, I am also ready to vote. But uh, it does occur to me that we could have we could meet next week, um, you know, and just postpone the CRC vote by a week or two. I don't know when they would meet. Uh, as far as I know, we don't have a meeting scheduled for next Wednesday evening, and I could make a meeting then. Thank you. Uh, Chris? So if we were going to meet next week, um, we would have to have a very minimal um, amount of paperwork. We could post an agenda that would just include voting on these two items. And um, that would be it because I'm going to be out of town Friday, Monday, and Tuesday. And I think Pam is going to be out of the office on part of Friday. And so there's not going to be a lot of, um, what should I say, manpower, woman power behind putting a meeting together. So if all, all we have to do is have an agenda, post the agenda, have a meeting on Wednesday, the 26th. I think we could do that. Okay, let's hear from uh, Johanna. I was just gonna say that I think I'm ready to vote too. Okay, I, I am as well. So that's four of the seven that are that are ready to vote. Um, I, I think that Janet was gonna provide an email or something. I, Chris, did you receive anything of that nature? From, I don't from, uh, believe Janet. I received anything from Janet. And I stopped looking at my email around 4.30, 4.45 tonight. Um, but Janet probably wouldn't be able to vote on the moratorium because she was here for the public hearing. I see. Um, so she yeah, could vote I, I, on it, it, You know, I think we're looking pretty good just to, to, to you know, do our deliberation to have do our additional comments and, and uh, uh, you know, tally up our votes. So um, it's looking that way. So, um, I mean, I can go, do I need to do a, a roll call for, for, for us continuing, Chris, do you think, or just get into it? Can I interrupt really quickly? Uh, Tom's missing, Tom Long. Oh, where is he? he? Must have left. He's an attendee. Oh, he's he's an attendee. So I'm going to bring him back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. I don't. How could one of our board members? I'm still here. Do you want to bring oh. the attendee? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. I'm happy hanging around here, but <laughs> you can move me into the attendee. I must have put Tom over there and not Shalane. <laughs> And what about Darcy? I just I sent you an email and I was flicking my raised hand. I was just <laughs> oh. get, get you have to know my text. You have to text. Oh my goodness. Uh, what about Darcy? She's gonna go to attendees also, isn't she? she <laughs> <laughs> um we better Johanna, take a you, double you, take. Yes, go ahead and put me in attendees. Yeah. Okay, everybody's hands are down. Okay, uh, so at this point, Chris, do you recommend that we take a vote to continue? Or, or because it was a straw poll, it looks like we have the numbers oh, yeah. to continue tonight, but. Um, to continue um, with your, on your path to voting. Okay. I think you probably do have that. Okay, 
So let's let's uh, discuss uh, zoning by law. Again, we, we've had the hearing. The hearing is closed. We're going to deliberate. And then, um, so this is on the zoning by law, Article 15, inclusionary zoning. To see if the town will vote to amend Article 15 of the zoning by law, inclusionary zoning, by expanding the scope of local preference, extending the applicability to more residential developments, and adding new definitions and tiered affordability. So um, people want to, you know, discuss beyond what, you know, we have uh, thus far. Um, so Jack, this is Nate. I think, oh, you know, hey, Doug Nate. had a comment about changing the or. I was going to share my screen again. <clears throat> um, in 15.1.2, so on one or more adjacent properties developed at the same time or in phases or that share aspects of the properties. I feel like that was something that was brought up, um, you know, a, a pretty specific comment. And the other one was just, you know, eliminating some of these exe exemptions here. So I, you know, those are, from my notes, I mean, there are other, there are other comments, but those are kind of specific to the bylaw uh, as written, and then there are a few others. Um, but so I, just, I just wanted to, you know, to me, those are oh, the things that I, that I very, was considering. Very helpful, Nate. Thank you. Thank you. Because, uh, you know, again, we, we, it's been an hour, hour and a half since we talked about this, but um, good reminder. So uh, do you see any issue with, with Doug's suggestion? for changing it to and or? Nate? No, I, I you know, I, um, you know, let me just go back to it. I, you know, I actually think the, um, when he said it, and then I think someone, I don't know, someone else reiterated it. I, it does make me think that, um, you know, that would be, I think that, no, I don't want to say it's a loophole, but I think they're, you know, the way that's phrased now, I think you would have to have both, you know, both parts of it would have to be true. And so I'm not sure that's necessarily what, what we want. So um, I think changing it is, is for the better. Changing it to end or? Uh, just saying or. So, or that share aspects of the properties. Remove and. So, yeah, right. So this would just be um, oh, my text. Line. Okay. So we have that modification to 1512 uh, with regard to a, you know, a future um, motion. I would, I would uh, propose. And then with regard to your, you know, going down to the exemptions. I think to me that, I mean, I don't know, Rob, what, if you're reading the bylaw now, sorry, Jack, I just want to, uh, uh, Rob had his hand raised and he's. Well, okay. Yeah. Then we got, we got Rob and we got Doug and Chris. Okay. So Rob. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Nate, I just wanted to remind you, that we actually had that language as uh, it's being suggested now prior. And our, our question at the time was about um, what would it mean to develop adjacent parcels in phases um, and we, we were really um, trying to capture the situation where they shared, you know, common entranceways, utility connections, uh, where, where a project was developed more as a uh, larger um, uh, set of units or buildings on multiple properties and not so much, you know, one lot being developed and then two years later or the next year, even another lot next door being developed we weren't trying to capture that at least in our discussions uh with staff so rob what would your recommendation be well i i don't i don't have a problem with doug's recommendation i just wanted to remind nate that we chose specifically not to do that uh and and uh have that be you know have that be a um uh, a, a less of an incentive for a developer to purchase multiple properties that are adjacent to each other uh, that may in fact develop them over time, one lot or 
uh, structure or building at a time and try to close a loophole on combining properties and benefiting from sharing those common uh, parts of infrastructure or uh, whatever it might be for the part of the development. And that's what, that's what this language does is it, it, it really goes after that, that proposal to develop multiple properties together, uh, not individually. And that was done intentionally. Doug? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I basically made that observation and I wouldn't even call it a recommendation. Um, it was just an observation that having the and means, you know, both sides of that and have to be, uh, have to be in place in order for the, the restriction to take place. So I'm fine with just leaving it as and. Um, I think, you know, it's my understanding that town council can adjust the language, you know, in a couple of weeks when they, whenever they get it, uh, assuming we, uh, you know, I mean, so this isn't quite, doesn't have to be perfect tonight, but, and, and I'm not even sure that I really care one way or the other. I just saw it as something that if I'm trying to wiggle my way out of this, uh, having that and look like it would be an opportunity that you wouldn't have if you had the or. But I, Rob, I hear what you're saying, and you know you've got a little more experience with this than I do, so I'm fine with leaving it as and. Yeah, but I do think Doug, to your point though, is you know, so what if someone a developer is like, well, rather than, you know, yeah, it would be better to have a common driveway, but you know what, I don't want to do inclusionary zoning, so I'm just gonna have two separate driveways on adjacent properties just because it saves me from doing, you know. A few affordable units. I mean, I think that's that's the reality of having this and there, that we might get some actually maybe some undesired, you know, some some someone would find a way to not do it. Um, so so we would get less pavement as is, Nate. I'm thinking if we say the and, yeah, and that share aspects. I think no, I think we'd get more pavement. So for instance, you have, if you have two adjacent properties and someone's thinking, oh, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to put, I'm going to develop these both at the same time. Oh, but wait a minute. You know, if, you know, you know, I'm going to have two separate driveways so I don't trigger that and, right? Rather than maybe I'd only have one driveway and have a better parking layout. I don't want to trigger inclusionary zoning. So I'm going to do two separate driveways and two separate parking lots, even though a better site plan might be to have one driveway and one parking lot between the two properties. I mean, so I, as is will result in less pavement. Yeah, I mean, okay. I, I, it's just one example, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Um, Chris, you, is your hand up? Okay. Yeah, my hand is up. I wanted to say um, that I don't think we should remove standard subdivisions and conven conventional standard subdivisions or cluster subdivisions from the list of exemptions. Um, first of all, there's not that much land left in, in Amherst where anybody is going to develop a subdivision, a new subdivision. So I don't think it's really going to be an issue. And it really does complicate. Uh, Chris, wait one minute. Can we scroll to that portion? Okay. Mm -hmm. The list of exemptions, except for units resulting from, and Steve Schreiber um, encouraged you to consider um, not exempting conventional residential subdivisions or cluster developments. And I think you should exempt them for now. And if you decide later on that you don't want to exempt them, you can always make that change and it would be fairly simple. But we don't have that many opportunities for um, either type of um, development, right? At this time, there's not that much land left. So I don't think this is gonna be a big, um, a big source of affordable units and it really complicates things. And I think it makes, makes, it would make it harder to administer these things for the planning department. And so for right now, I think to simplify things, leave it in. Um, you can decide later to uh, decide differently. That, that would be my advice. Chris, the RF district again, I, I'm oh, forgetting the RF what that district is. is all about students. 
So what's allowed there is primarily um, dormitories and buildings related to um, student life. And okay. so um, you're not really going to get affordable units there. We had a long discussion with various attorneys at the state level when Archipelago was developing the um, building at Olympia Drive, Olympia Place. Yeah. And it turned out that, you know, we really couldn't um, require affordable. Well, it it turned out that we decided not to require affordable units, but there was a lot of argument in favor of not requiring. So again, again, it it would just complicate things. So I, I would leave that the way it is here. Leave that alone. Okay. Um, Rob, is your hand up? No. Okay. Um, so any other discussion amongst uh, the board on uh, this article as proposed? Okay. And, and we're not doing public comment because we already did had the hearing, correct, Chris? Yep. Hearing's okay. closed. Mm-hmm. So um, with that, I guess we could take a motion. Maria? I move to approve the article as written with no edits. Very good. Is there a second? Second. All right, Doug. Uh, any discussion? I see none. All right, let's do a roll call here. Uh, Maria? Approve. And Andrew? Aye. Uh, Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. And Janet is not with us. Uh, Johanna? Aye. And myself would be an aye. Very good. Okay, so let's uh, move to the next item that we're going to deliberate post the hearing, which is the uh, zoning bylaw article 16, temporary moratorium for 180 days on building permits for construction of residential buildings with three or more dwelling units. To see if the town will vote to add Article 16, temporary moratorium for 100 days or, uh, or excuse me, on building permits for construction of residential buildings with three or more dwelling units to the zoning bylaw. Uh, I'm not gonna read the rest because we just uh, had this presented. So uh, Chris, you have, you have your hand up. Oh, I just wanted to go back and, and reword the motion for the previous um, article, which really I think should have been moved to recommend to town council that town council adopt the inclusionary zoning article as written. Um, yeah. Can I change my, my previous move or do I have to re-say it? I'm move that the planning board recommends the town council to, to adopt. I've forgotten what you said already. I think that's what we understood. Okay. Yes. But I think <laughs> we're, <laughs> said, so we're only recommending. Um, and Doug seconds the and, rewording. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And we're okay with not taking a vote again on that. Right. I mean, I think we understood that was here. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to clarify. Anybody, any, any, anyone object to that? Okay, I see none. All right. So um, on to Article 16, uh, the building moratorium. Um, any, any board members want to uh, discuss this further? Uh, Doug? I was just going to move that we hold a vote to uh, on whether to recommend this proposal or this petition for adoption by town council. Uh, is there a second? I'm not sure I understand the motion. I didn't understand the motion. Can you say the motion? My motion. My motion was that we. Uh, hold a vote on whether to recommend to town council or not. So the vote is. Oh, I guess you could say I was calling the question without uh, wording it in such a way as to indicate whether I supported or opposed the measure. So then you're going to have two votes. One vote to to say yes, we want to vote, 
and then the next vote to actually vote. Mm -hmm. Sound right. Okay. <laughs> um, Johanna, do you want to, uh, we'll, we'll still have a, 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 an opportunity to discuss here before we vote, but Johanna? I was gonna second Doug's motion. Okay, so now we can discuss. Um, and personally, I, I, had, I had some items there that I just wanna get off my, my chest, so to speak. Um, personally, I think the, the, the thing for me is, is, is parking and uh, the moratorium, you know, would put, you know, provide maybe an opportunity for, for reevaluating, you know, where we are with parking, but I don't see it changing. Uh, you know, anything else, I, I don't think like parking has been on our agenda much with regard to the zoning priorities and, you know, maybe it should be. Um, but I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not really moved by the, the the arguments of shadows, and and narrow sidewalks and open space, um, because I, um, again, I think one East Pleasant Street, you know, needs a fixed. But otherwise, our sidewalks are fine. Uh, shadows, there are shadows. Um, up on Main Street that nobody complains about. I'm not sure why, but there definitely are shadows uh, from a five-story building uh, in that area, but nobody complains about it. Um, and when it comes to open space in downtown, I don't really, I, I mean, I don't go downtown to get open space feeling. I mean, Amherst has the most highest percentage of open space, recreational space, of any town in the Pioneer Valley. And um, I understand it has value, but I, you know, I would couch that somewhat, you know, given, you know, where the particular, you know, development may be. And um, that's, I just had, a, I, I just wanted to state that from, from the prior discussion. So uh, Maria. Oh. Yeah, I, there are a lot of subjective things said tonight, you know, very emotional things. But mm -hmm. the bottom line is um, Amherst uh, has a very, very uh, comprehensive review process in place. So many uh, departments and eyes on each project, more so than a lot of other surrounding cities. And then the other sort of non-subjective aspect is that this moratorium is basically, uh, I think one of the people wrote that best was that, it's basically a moratorium on the downtown recovery and of businesses and of people working. And um, it just didn't make any sense at all to me, honestly. And I just, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm ready. I mean, I'd like to hear if everyone else wants to make any comments, but I'm ready to make a motion to not recommend it to town council for consideration, if that's the right wording. But, um, but I also didn't want to like put the kibosh on if anyone else and the board wanted to say anything. But yeah. Can, so, that motion, so, can that motion float out there while while more people say things? But um, so, yeah, so we can wait on a second there if, if yeah. other folks want to. Um, Only if I said it correctly, Chris. I moved to. Yo, know, Andrew's got his hand up. Andrew and Tom. Andrew, please. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, you know, I, I tend to agree, Maria. I um, and I'm I'm just like a little tie right now but the 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 area that i have uh just some concern around is just you know the first half talking about the inclusionary zoning is um what other mechanisms do we have in place with the proposal in front of us for example to be able to incent to get some uh you know some some uh fair market or low moderate income housing in place into those new developments You know, I, you know, uh, Andrew, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and, and again, that, that didn't really get addressed. Does providing more housing alleviate and um, encourage affordable housing by taking pressure off, you know, 
you know, the, 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 we're talking about, you know, downtown right now, but I think that's something that hasn't been addressed, uh, you know, adequately. But uh, to me, my gut tells me that more housing is going to help the overall situation, you know, in the town of Amherst. Uh, Tom? Sure. Thanks, Jack. I mean, I, I think, you know, one of my questions is pretty clear to them in terms of not seeing cor a correlation between the, the goals of the moratorium and the deliverables that they're saying are going to come out the other end. And, and um, you know, so I have, I have a problem because I, I, I do see ways in which we can enhance the business downtown with, you know, with financing and all kinds of other things. But Zoning's not going to do that per se. And I don't think the design standards you're going to get are going to fix the problem. So, I mean, because I, I still think they're going to allow for buildings like that roughly to, to show up. So I don't know if it's going to solve the problem. And I also have sometimes take issue with the idea that we live in a town with a massive industry. And if that industry were some factory and we were talking about housing factory workers, we wouldn't be having a conversation about not wanting them to live downtown. And because our industry just happens to be education, we say that those people can't live downtown. And that's, that's where I find the problem in terms of the way we think about who's living where, because um, it's our industry and we have to support our industry. And, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not in favor for, for a few reasons, but one primarily, I don't think it's going to solve the problems that we want, we want that they're trying to address. And I think the ones that we are already trying to address, and as Chris said, the amendments are going to get us to a place where we can address at least some of them on the short term. Very good. Thanks. Um, Joanna? I grieve at the amount of time that our staff have spent working on this as opposed to advancing solutions. And so, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you, uh, Doug. Yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, I have felt like this was, on the one hand, it was unnecessary because if you look at the six bullets of what they want to accomplish, we're well into, we're well down the road of accomplishing uh, an evaluation of four of them. Uh, the fifth one has to do with the municipal parking overlay, which feels like a conversation that is really complicated and could take years. And then the last one is this climate action resilience uh, plan, which hasn't even been released yet. Um, I asked town staff earlier this week to give me a copy of it, and it's not available. So, you know, who knows what that's going to have and whether anybody wants to adopt what's in that. So I, I feel like it's, this is an unnecessary uh, motion. And then because of the timelines involved in some of these conversations and getting things through the process, I think it's inadequate to accomplish its purpose. So uh, I intend to vote against it. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, uh, Johanna? I'm lowering my hand. It's a vestigial tail. Oh, okay. Yeah, Andrew? I would just say, um, this is actually, I, I've really enjoyed this. I went into the meeting today thinking that I was going to be like a dissenting vote and hearing folks talk has actually um, been very useful to me. And I, I, I appreciate hearing from everybody on this. Thank you. Um, so, you know, in, in my mind, I, I'm wondering if we can, um, all right, so we need to to uh, move to to uh, vote in favor or not in favor of this now. I guess, um, Chris, you got to help me out because we kind of got down a road here. That's just, I think you know. Doug could move to, uh, could withdraw his um, 
motion and the person who seconded would be Johanna could withdraw her second and then someone could make a motion to um, vote to recommend against, vote, vote to recommend to town council that they not adopt article 16 on the temporary moratorium. Okay, Doug. Yeah, I was gonna, uh, I was on the same wavelength. I, I withdraw my motion. Okay, and Johanna, good. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering in terms of a, an adder, if the town can put the, the, the parking aspect of things, because I don't see that in, in the zoning. You know, Chris, let me know. I mean, maybe I'm missing some, but I don't see the downtown parking as one of the zoning priorities. And it, it just seems to be a, hu a driver. And um, can we recommend to the CRC that that becomes one of the, the main zoning priority you know, efforts so, within the coming months? I think you could do that under a separate motion. And I wanted to say that Nate and I just had a conversation today with two members of town staff about parking and they're really involved in it. And um, we recognize the fact that we have to take another look at the municipal parking district that was developed in the 60s, revised in the 2000s. And now we've got a lot of development downtown. So we really need to take another look at that. So that's on our radar screen. And if you wanted to make a motion to ask the CRC to put it on a priority list, I think that would be well received. Okay. All right, so at, at this point, uh, we have a motion uh, with regard to um, um, not approving the proposed zoning bylaw, you know, Article 16 for the temporary moratorium for 180 uh, days on building permits for construction of residential buildings with three or, or more dwelling units. Um, is there a motion? Maria made that motion about. Oh, Maria. Okay. And then a second. And nobody seconded. Seconded. Okay. Um, Doug. And so uh, any discussion for the discussion? I see none. Okay. Let's do roll call. Um, Maria. Approve. And Andrew. Sorry. This is to not subsended for, correct? This is to recommend that town council not adopt Article 16. Aye. Doug? Aye. Tom? Aye. Johanna? Aye. And I am an I as well. So that's six zero. And I guess I would like uh, to make a motion that there is a... Um, a priority set for you know, resolution of, of downtown parking concerns within our zoning priority bylaws. Because to me, that seems like uh, a crux of you know, a lot of the issues associated, associated with what was behind the, the building moratorium. But, um, a second. Doug? Doug second. OK. No, I did not second. Did, who second? It was Tom. 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 Okay. Okay. So, any any discussion on that or? Yes. Yes. Okay. Doug. Yeah, I'd like to talk about this at our next meeting, or I don't want to talk about it tonight. Okay. So, can you put this on the agenda, Chris? Next uh, meeting. The next meeting is going to be all about Archipelago. How about if we put it on the agenda for the sixteenth? Sounds good. Okay, I ran out of paper in my pad here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So I'm on my I'm, last sheet. So are you talking about just parking oh in general? <laughs> uh, the discussion of parking as a zoning priority, is that? I think you're talking about looking at the um, municipal parking district. Is that right? Correct. So yeah. only, Correct. only municipal parking district, not about Article 7 or any other parking, or is it just really the municipal parking district? Let's focus on one thing at a time, municipal right. parking district, okay? And that's that's why I want to talk about this at another time. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and Chris, one of the things is how the town is offering cheaper parking permits than UMass. 
That was another thing we discussed today. Yeah. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of stuff going on there with parking that I think would address, you know, a lot of the, you know, the, these, these uh, two hearings that we had today. Well, not two, but the moratorium anyway. So I think we're going to have to rope Nate into coming to the hearing on the 16th in the meeting on the 16th, because he's our resident parking expert. And well, is there, that, but um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I also think that there's, you know, things outside of zoning and, you know, whether even in, not in the general bylaws, there's other regulations that could apply too. So, I mean, it's, I think, I think there's a number of factors. So why don't I put on the agenda kind of a parking um, umbrella mm -hmm. with, um, with some focus on the municipal parking district. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And um, okay. So I think we hit all the other items and it's 11 o'clock on the dot. I think we can Thanks. adjourn. Mr. Andrew's hand is still up. Mr. Medusa. Whose hand? Andrew. Oh, Andrew. Yeah, not to kill. I wanted to make sure we got all the way to 11, just so I could make it through. <laughs> but um, no, I actually had a, like a, a really simple new business question I forgot earlier. Is like, are we, um, what's, what's the town policy like on having these uh, meetings in person with some of the latest uh, news announcements? Is that in our foreseeable future or are we still Zoom for a long time? That is unclear. It's, um, we know that the governor is ending the state of emergency as of June 15th. What we're not sure of is, is he going to take away the ability for um, groups such as the planning boards to have meetings in, um, in a rem remote format. Um, and we haven't heard anything about that yet. Usually we get um, some kind of announcement from the state in a written form. We get something from the town manager in a written form, and then we get something from KP Law. And we haven't gotten anything like that. And previously, a couple of weeks ago, the town manager has said that he thought we would be having Zoom meetings through the end of the summer. So it's all to be worked out. Okay, thanks. Good question. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so at this point, I think we're, we're, we're good. Correct? You're going to move to adjourn? <laughs> Just say we're adjourned. Someone, yeah, we're adjourned. We're Thank adjourned. Thank you all. It was a long night, but I think it was a very productive we one. We did it.